Mike Francis, episode number 21. Mike is a dear, sweet friend of mine. Uh, I would say Canada's number one top session guitar player for the last 40 years. He's been uh, involved in the Toronto recording scene uh, for a very, very long time. His list of accomplishments is just huge, and I thought I'd share a few things with you. Uh, here's just a few people he's recorded with. Um, Alanis Morissette, Anne Murray, Dan Hill, Jim Brickman, Gordon Lightfoot, Enrique Iglesias, Olivia Newton-John, uh, Danielle Lanois, Smokey Robinson, Jan Arden, Phil Ramone, uh, goes down to uh, let's see George Canyon, David Foster, uh, and that's just a small little sample of the list here. It goes on and on and on. Um, also, uh, Mike was involved in the the huge jingle scene that was uh, in the 70s, 80s, and 90s in Toronto, uh, and we'll talk about that in the podcast. And uh, these are the some of the jingles that Mike had played on uh, Budweiser, McDonald's, Pepsi, Coke, Harvey's, uh, Miller, Molson, uh, Labatt's, GM Trucks, Esso, Ford, Pontiac, The Bay, Canadian Pacific, uh, See Pizza Pizza, Swish LA, Tim Hortons, Wendy's, Air Canada, uh, Honda, LCBO, Old South, Mazda, Eaton's, just a whole ton. That's just a small portion of the list too. And uh, Mike also played on a lot of TV shows, uh, background music, etc., and part of them, uh, The Ron James Show, Beverly Hills 90210, Street Legal, Fraggle Rock, Sesame Street, uh, The Juno Awards, Austin City Limits, Nashville Swing, The Tommy Hunter Show, uh, and that list goes on and on as well. He was also the music director on the Ronnie Prophet TV show for six years. Um, and music director on today's country live radio show from 92 to 96. Now it's syndicated uh, across Canada. He's also won uh, Producer Instrumentalist of the Year awards a bunch. And as a producer, uh, he's produced the Mavericks, Jeff Healy, uh, Beverly Mahood, Dallas Harms, Dick Dameron, Terry Carice, Carol Baker, Matt Minglewood, uh, Anita Paris, The Good Brothers. Uh, and this list goes uh, on and on as well. So... A real brilliant guy, and uh, I remember hiring Mike Francis. I talk about it a bit. I think I got a little choked up when I talked about it. But Mike uh, was so kind to me when I hired him uh, uh, to do uh, the first session with him, and and he did a lot for me after that first session because it was so amazing. Uh, I really, really appreciate that, and I appreciate our friendship, and it was a lot of fun to sit down, and this is a great kind of listen. I think you'll, you'll enjoy this one a lot. Here we go. Well, it is. <laughs> it is. Your mom's amazing. But my, you know, she's, uh, my wife's a lot like your mom. Yeah, they're very much the same, aren't they? Yeah, very much the same. Yeah. Yeah, the house is perfect at all times, and the cooking is unbelievable, and the you know, sweet personalities, and just easy to be with yeah i like that yeah i like it too all right we're rolling we're rolling well good afternoon hey there mike how you doing darren good it's uh this is a podcast i've wanted to do for a while it's when i started doing these um you were certainly on the short list for sure of people i wanted to talk to and the cool thing was when we touched base last week and we're talking about it and you said hey do you want me to send a bio and you know, for a second, I was like, yeah, no, I, you know, we'll just chat and, yeah. and stuff. But then you send it and then I looked at it and I was like, holy crap. I mean, I knew that you had played with a lot of people and you did a lot of stuff and the bio was just scratching the surface. But man, you've played with a lot of people. I've been, I mean, yeah, I've been very lucky. <laughs> the list is gigantic. Um, and I think it's one of those things where because you're, um, the people who know you really know you, right? Yeah. And they, they, know, they know the name, Mike Francis. Peppy, I'm going to figure yes. out how we got that name. We'll get into that. Um, but uh, the people outside of that, I don't think all understand you know, everything that you've done. It's, it's pretty impressive. Well, I mean, it's just what I did. If it was my, it was my job or my career, whatever you want to call it, I, I look at it just as that's what I did. Yeah. But uh, and I was lucky, you know, luck, luckiest guy in the world, for uh, a hillbilly kid from Chatham, Ontario, to, to end up doing what I ended up doing. So let's let's kind of go back and just 
kind of dive into how you got started. Did you, you were born in the Chatham area then or? Yep. In Chatham, Ontario. Uh, my parents are both from there and, uh, grew up there and around that area moved, you know, moved a lot, but, but always in that, in that area, Chatham, Blenheim, Wallaceburg, that, that little area down yeah. Southern Ontario. And my dad was, uh, um, much like your family, I guess I grew up the same way as you did. Uh, my dad was a country singer, yeah, and uh, you know that was his dream, and that never quite happened for him. But um, so I, you know, luckily for me, I, I grew up hearing the music that he loved, which was uh, you know Bob Wills, Ray Price, Hank Williams, whatever you know, all, yeah. all that that era of country music. But we lived close to Detroit, so I also grew up listening to Motown. Oh yeah, which saved my life, I think. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Not, and and I love country music. No, don't get me wrong, but it's you know it's it, it really is nice to have both influences. And at the same time, my mother, who wasn't a musician or at all, uh, loved singers like uh, Nat King Cole. Yeah, it's one of the best singers in the world. Yeah. Uh, so I got that influence as well, right? Uh, so it was yeah, so it was sort of organic or or all by accident. So did your dad playing instruments was he a guitar player at all or? he was a strummer an acoustic yeah. guitar strummer but i mean he could, he could play drums he could play bass he, he was uh he could have played a bunch of different instruments really well if he decided to uh if, if he had chosen to right but he, yeah. he wanted to be uh, uh the front man he wanted to be the star and uh it was his you know the big dream which uh he had a, when i was a little kid my dad i mean a little kid like three four five years old my dad and his band had a a uh, weekly radio show in Chatham, Ontario, on CFCO Radio in Chatham, right. and it was the old-fashioned country, you know, f- uh, half an hour radio show on Wednesday yeah. nights from seven thirty to eight o'clock or whatever, and uh, and they played the hits of the day and you know uh, live, like in a little cramped studio, yeah, you know, five-piece band and and just blasting away in a little studio and for half an hour a week, and he opened, he was the open his band, him and his he and his band were the opening act for. Uh, a lot of the Nashville artists of the day, uh, like uh, Farron Young, uh, Jim Reeves, yeah. uh, Brenda Lee, you know, all those kind of people that, that had big hits, Patsy Cline, uh, Loretta Lynn. Yeah. Uh, so they were the opening act, and sometimes they backed up the big stars if they didn't bring their own band, some, yeah. and then other times they, you know, they did bring their own band. So he had, he got to that place, and then he had a wife and a kid, and he couldn't, it was hard to move on, right? Yeah. You know, to move past that, and it was hard to leave a wife, and he wasn't the kind of guy to leave a wife and kid behind and, and say, oh, well, I'm going on the road, see you later, you know? Yeah. So, uh, he, you know, he didn't happen for him, basically, but uh, yeah. didn't quite get his due, but he certainly made a good stab at it. It was, uh, I like how you described his playing, he was a strummer. Yeah. And that, it's perfect. I mean, not too many people describe a front guy who plays acoustic as that, but that's a lot of time. That's what it is. That's they, exactly the yeah, gig. Yeah, they're there. The instruments there for comfort. Yeah, to some degree, and to strum along. And but you're a singer, and yeah, your instruments are definitely a secondary thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That was his uh, his approach to uh, to it. But I mean, he was a talented guy. Yeah, he, and he could have, as I said, played. A, you know, he played drums. Uh, the the uh, he went on the road two times in, in his life of give it a little shot for a couple of months each time never really uh, went that far but the one the second time that he did it uh, which is when I stumbled into to playing the guitar more was he was playing drums with Gary Buck's band who's oh, a, yeah. Gary Buck who you know I'm sure yeah. Canadian icon and uh, so you know he that was a his sort of last uh, hur- hurrah and then he came home and said ah, this isn't going to work and I don't like it anyway you know so, yeah. you know, so uh, let's just go go home so what what made you choose the guitar? Was was that the first? I imagine that that's the first thing you kind of dove into. Yeah, it was the only instrument in the house. That's why yeah. I chose it. And actually, at first, um, I started playing when I was about eight years old because my mother hinted to me very clearly. She said, "You know, your dad'd really like it if you took up the guitar a little bit." And I said, eh, "I don't know, my." You know, and I, I wanted to play baseball or something at the time, but I wasn't any good at it, but I wanted to play baseball. Yeah. And uh, so anyway, I finally started messing around with the guitar, and uh, and, and my, my dad, like I said, had limited knowledge, showing me a little bit, and uh, and so that, yeah, it, it, that was the only instrument in the house. There wasn't a piano, and there, you know, in, in that in the world that I lived in, uh, I'm an only child, so, you know, um, I didn't have that many other influences, right? Yeah. Uh, so you're kind of on your own. 
and uh, you pick up what you pick up from your parents, basically, when you're a, a, you know, an only child. So I, you know, like I said, heard my mother's what my mother liked, what my dad liked, and then found out I liked Motown at the same time. So that's pretty cool mix. Yeah, so it's a wild mixture and then a weird mixture, yeah. and uh, and then the, you know the guitar thing just evolved. So did you were you teaching yourself or did you have a teacher? Yeah, just taught mm. you. Never studied. <laughs> no, uh, l later um, I'll tell. We'll, we'll probably talk, cross. Yeah, we'll cross. Uh, uh, we'll go across this later, I'm sure. But uh, no, I, I did. I, I took some lessons in my 20s because for uh, not to play, not for guitar playing, but for other reasons yeah. uh, that I was desperately in need of help at the time. But no, I'm self-taught. So yeah. uh, I, I picked up the guitar and. And when I got really serious about her, when I got the disease, it was basically out of loneliness. Right. <laughs> Honest, honestly, sounds just like a sad story, but it wasn't sad. It just was what it was. Well, I was very much the same. I mean, I mean, I had an older brother and an older sister, but when I started, it was we lived rural, yeah. in the country. Um, there wasn't much to do. There's only two or three channels, and mm -hmm. um, there wasn't the internet. Yep. And you listened to a lot of records and. And that's you know for how I learned just listening and trying to yeah. lift. Yep. Um, and you gravitated stuff. gravitated to the to the fiddle. Yep. I did have fiddle lessons when I started, but other instruments I played, I definitely. I mean, I, I took fiddle f lessons for a while. Yeah. Until I, I think I felt comfortable, and then I just didn't like lessons. Yeah. I, I didn't like. I just wanted to do what I wanted to do. Yeah. And learn the way I wanted to learn. Um, whether that was smart or not, I don't know. Uh, but it's, I think, it doesn't matter how you get there. No. As long as you get there. As long as you get there, yeah. Yeah, yeah no, that, that's absolutely true. And it, it's sort of the same thing with me. It's just like there, there was no rhyme or reason to it. It was uh, all by accident. Yeah. It was just a series of, you know, as I've, I've told people before, it was kind of like a Marx Brothers movie. It was a, a bit of a comedy sketch, really. <laughs> it's like, it just, I, how did you get, you know, uh, from, from here to here? I don't know. It just happened. It just you know, yeah. like the circumstances, basically, of your life. Like you said, living in the country, there's not much else to do. Yeah. And I lived in a little town, you know, there's not much to do there. So when you're teaching yourself, do you remember, were you listening to records and trying to copy what was going on? Or were you just sitting trying to figure out, obviously your dad would teach you some chords and um, that thing, but what, do you remember your method of learning? Uh, well, uh, I can tell you how it happened, mm -hmm. which is probably the the simplest way to, to get there. Um, my dad had, you know, un limited ability on a few instruments, like I said, like yeah. drums, bass, guitar, and that, that was probably about it. And, uh, you know, he knew a few chords, but not a lot, right? Um, so uh, he showed me what he knew, which was five or six chords. And I was happy with, with that when I was a kid. And I wanted to really, when I was like 10, 12 years old, I just wanted to... Uh, I wanted to be like my dad. I wanted to be the singer in the band. Yeah, and and I was happy just strumming and uh, and singing, and I I uh, I was in my first little band when I was thirteen, and and uh, we did it. Our, my first gig was a New Year's Eve gig, wow. and I knew about a dozen songs, you yeah. know, and uh, playing with guys that were all uh, you know thirty years older than me. Yeah, I was thirteen years old, and, and we made we played New Year's Eve and made three dollars each. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome that's, that's, and that's usually double though you usually get on New Year's Eve right? or four times yeah. Yeah, you, yeah so I don't know what they made you know on a regular gig a buck and a half or a dollar I don't know but uh, that was my first real gig was this with this band and we made three dollars I thought wow I've made it you know yeah. and uh, you know it sang my dozen songs and uh, that was it so what what happened was what what how it evolved from that was uh, um when I was 14, um, the, the, the day after grade eight ended, we moved from Chatham yeah. and uh, we moved to Sault Ste. Marie because that's when my dad went on the road with Gary Buck, who I mentioned earlier. Yeah. And so uh, we moved to Sault Ste. Marie. I'm 14 years old. Uh, my dad goes on the road playing you know, all over Ontario with Gary Buck. My mom went and got a job because we needed the money yeah. and I'm at home alone. And, and I didn't know one person in Sault Ste. Marie, not one human being, nobody. Yeah. So you're 14 years old. All I had was a bunch of Chad Atkins records, and I had my dad's acoustic guitar, and I had never 
aspired to becoming, I, like a few times in the, the little band I was in, they said to me, why don't you play some solos? I said, oh, I don't know how, I don't want to do that. I just want to sing. Yeah. So I sat down with his guitar, his old Gibson acoustic, which was the, the first guitar I'd ever played, and uh, these Chet Atkins records, and I just beat myself up every day for about eight hours a day while my mom was at work. But like I said, I was lonely, right? Yeah. I had nothing else to do. So I sat there going, you know, tried to get the thumb going with the thumb pick going, doing dick, 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 dick. Learn to do that and then try and get the melody on top of doing dick, 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 falling apart. And I, you know, I did that for about two months, day in and day out. And then one morning I woke up and I put on the Chet Atkins record and put on Freight Train. And I picked up the guitar and I went and I went ding 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 I guess, and I found myself I, I could play freight train, like oh. I and I'd been trying to play freight train for two months, right? Yeah. And finally, I because I was just either lonely enough or bullheaded enough too. That's the other thing, stupid and bullheaded. And I just kept doing it all day long. And finally, I got up one day, and there it was. I wasn't stumbling. I could get through it. And then I learned another one, and then I learned another one, and then I learned another one. You know, all Chadak and stuff. And I had a, a few other records at the time. Uh, but be, because the Chet stuff lent itself to the finger style kind of picking, and, yeah. and uh, then the, the I was playing in a in a, uh, a little band in, at the time in Sault Ste. Marie where we were living, and uh, I was playing snare drum literally, like it was like the set. Uh, you know, it wasn't. I didn't have a set of drums. I had a snare drum and a hi hat. Yeah, <laughs> you know. That was, what else do you need? <laughs> what else? Well, that's all they needed at the Opry. That's what they, they used yeah. at the Grand Old Opry, right? So that's uh, you know, like the guys in, in this particular band said, "That's all you need." And I said, "Okay, fine." So I, you know, I could do that because my dad showed me how. He said, "Here, you just do this," and they, you know, it just you don't have to do nothing else. Okay, fine. Yeah. Play the back beat and, and play a little bit of hi hat. There you go. So. Uh, uh, what the magic that, uh, or what, what opened my eyes, uh, or, or, or I guess validated it for me was, I, as I briefly mentioned a while ago, I was always terrible at sports. I was literally terrible. Like the last guy that anybody wanted on their team, right? Yeah. And whatever sport it was, baseball, hockey, football, for, forget it. I was terrible. And then I, I stumbled into, you know, this thing. I could play some tunes like Chet Atkins. And uh, I was with these older guys in this band of playing snare drum, and we were uh, doing a rehearsal or something like that. And I picked up somebody's guitar and started playing Freight Train one day. And all these 35 year old guys looked at me and said, Hey, how do you do that? And I said, What do you mean? It's just this. And they said, Slow it down and show me. And I went, Oh, the little light went off. I can't play baseball. I suck at, at hockey, but. Maybe I found my thing. Yeah. <laughs> you know, maybe I found something that that actually makes me feel like I have some uh, a purpose in life, and you know, and and say gives me some satisfaction, right? And so I'm not embarrassed about basically. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, the, out of that uh, that vacuum of loneliness, and also just being bullheaded, and saying I'm going to figure out how to do this, I stumbled across that, and. Uh, uh, make a long story short as possible when we uh, about a month or so after that a couple months after that we were only in Sault Ste. Marie, Marie for about three and a half months and we moved back to Chatham uh, in early October and my dad when we got back um, got uh, his old job that he had previously back and uh, a day job and and uh, so we you know we were do getting by doing okay and uh my dad said, well, I'd like to start, I'm going to start, an, he said, I've got an idea, I want to start another band, um, but I want to start it with a bunch of young guys like you, and uh, find some young guys that can play, and, he's, and, and, you know, we'll put it together, and it'll be, it'll, you know, it'll be cool and fun, we can play together, and, yeah. and it was cool, it was, same, again, the same kind of thing that, you know, that, that you went through with your family, right? Yeah. And uh, I said, that sounds great, and he says, yeah, you can play bass, you know, he said, I can show you how to play bass, and I said, no, I, Dad, I, I want to play lead guitar. 
And he said, I, yeah, I, I know you, you, you may want to do that, but I don't have time to, to wait for you to learn how to do that, is what he said, right? Yeah. And, and he had been away. Oh, yeah. He, he, he'd never heard me play. Yeah. And so I, I kept saying, no, but I want to play guitar. And he said, no, no, we'll get you a bass and I'll show you how to play it. And, it, you know, it's not that hard and it'll be fine. And I, I said, well, but, you know, I, uh, and so I didn't, you know, like the, you know how it is with a son and a father. I mean, there's only so much you can, uh, yeah. <laughs> that you want to get <laughs> before you're going to get in trouble with your dad. <laughs> you don't want to argue. So I finally waited till he came. I, I, this went on for a few weeks. And finally, when he came home from work one night, and he was sitting there reading the paper on the couch in the living room, and I, I put on the Chet Atkins record, and I got out the acoustic guitar, and I started playing along with the record. I played along with with Freight Train. Actually, I played along with one song. And the paper comes down, and he looks at me, and says, "Can you play any any other songs on that record?" And I said, "Yeah." The next one I played it, and the next one I played it, the next one I played it. He looked at me, and said, "Okay, tomorrow we're going to go find you an electric guitar and an amp. You're the you're the guitar player." <laughs> I said, "Good." So that was the start of the whole, yeah. you know, and I basically, as I tell people, yeah, with this is tongue in cheek, but I, I basically, at that point in my life, I got the guitar disease, Yeah, you know, like a music slash guitar disease. And uh, so I've, the same as you, I've always been self-taught. Um, I, I didn't take any lessons because yeah. uh, I stumbled on it. And then I just was, you know, I used to just, I used to go to sleep with the thing on my lap, like laying down in bed. I would have the, the guitar on my stomach playing it. You know, and fall asleep, Same, wake yeah. up in the morning and start playing again. And I'd come home from school at lunch, play guitar, run back to high school. This was, you know, high school days. And, you know, uh, come home for like, even for, for 20 minutes just to play the guitar, you know, and then run back, you know, and then come home from school the minute I got home from school, play the guitar. And then my mother was dragging me out of the bedroom for dinner, you know, like oh, yeah. literally, physically, you know, like if I have to drag you, I will. Yeah. Put it down and come eat. Oh, okay. Thanks, mom. <laughs> well, that really shows that you were really meant to play i, mean, I don't it's, know it's because you don't get that with everybody i think i think there's certain people who who find their thing and whether it's a musical instrument or if they play tennis or something mm -hmm. and what makes you really good is that drive to just keep playing and playing and playing and playing and uh um i mean there's i think you would have found yourself there no matter what happened probably maybe i guess but yeah. you know the you know, again like i said it was a lot of luck i mean it was it was the fact that there was only a guitar there there was only the chet atkins records um, my dad was away my mom went and got a job i'm alone we were in Sault Ste. Marie. Yeah. it's all those factors when you add it Happened, all up yeah. it's all those things come together and it's like and then out of it came something good yeah uh it was painful at the time <laughs> you know because like i said i was just plain lonely yeah. But but at the same time, uh, something really good came out of it, and then I I got the disease, and then I couldn't put the thing down. So what was the what was the first guitar you got? Do you remember what it was? The first real or the first electric guitar was uh, uh, a little Fender Mustang. Yeah, uh, which was a cool little guitar, N not really a pro instrument, but I I, uh, I lucked out and got a really good amp. It was a Fender Super Reverb. Oh wow a brand new super reverb at the time which was a really cool amp uh and the guitar was okay and li a few years later when i after i went on the road for a year or so i i you know upgraded to it to a, yeah. a better guitar but uh the little mustang did its job and and you know i mean it was uh it was a good enough instrument at the time yeah so you started with the band there with the younger the yeah younger guys and you did that for a little while i did yeah i did that for until uh, I was 17 and yeah. about uh, 17 and a half or getting close to 18 um, because we, we my dad and I were lucky we managed to find a young drummer yeah. that was they were all a few the guys were all a few years older than me I was always the kid yeah. in the band but uh, the drummer was a few years older than me the bass player was a few years older than me and then we got lucky and found a really good steel player that was just a few years older than the other guys and so we were, he, you know, he would, he was the, uh, other than my dad, who was, you know, in his thirties, this, that guy was like 22 or three. He was the yeah. older kid in the band. Right. And, uh, and it was a nice little band. We had a lot of fun. We did that for about two and a half years, at least maybe close to three, almost three years and, uh, had a ball. And then, 
Are you in touch with any of those guys? Yeah. Those yeah. Yeah, I still am. Yeah, two of them. Actually, all three of them. Actually, no, I'm, I'm wrong. All three of them. Yeah, I'm still in touch with them. And they're great guys and good friends. So yeah. the, yeah, I just saw, saw one of them uh, a couple months ago. He came to see me play in Richmond Hill. And uh, and I've, I talked to one of the other guys, the guy that played bass uh, on the phone, you know, every other week. Wow, so, right. Yeah, still good friends. Yeah. So uh, so that was a lot of fun, and it was funny. Uh, uh, then I, I guess you know I, I I'm the, the older guy in the you know from me in the band uh, was that steel guitar player who yeah. was uh, you know more mature, obviously than I was at fifteen sixteen years old. Yeah. Um, and uh, when I was seventeen, I was you know talking to him and. I didn't even realize it, but I must have been saying to him at the time, you know, I like he, he was basically saying because he was trying to he, he was involved with a music uh, a conservatory, a, a company that that gave lessons and, and sold instruments and stuff like that, right? Yeah. But uh, you know, back then the the big focus was accordion, oh yeah, and uh, and maybe a, a lap steel, yeah, and then a little bit of guitar. They had a few guitar students, so I, I he got me teaching guitar for him when I was like. 15, 16, which I had no reason to be doing at all because yeah. I, I didn't know anything. I was just making it up. Yeah. You know, I was just making anything up, you know. Uh, but so that I did that uh, f for a year and a half or so for him. And during that period, I was talking to him and I must have said to him, you know, like I, he said, what do you want to do? And I said, I, he, he was because he was trying to get me to to work for him as a teacher. And I said, I don't really want to do that. And he said, well, what do you want to do? I said, I want to go on the road because I wanted to learn how to, uh, I wanted to play more and I wanted to, play with more experienced players and, and I wanted to learn. Yeah. And I, there was no, there was never in my household just cause the, the world I grew up in, my parents were not uh, rich people and they weren't uh, that sophisticated. So I mean, there, there was never any concept of going to college or university yeah. for anything, Yeah. let alone to study music. I didn't even know that you could go study music and, you know, yeah. at, at university or, or I didn't know that such a thing existed. Right. That's how naive and stupid I was. So uh, it just, you know, I thought, well, the next logical step is to go on the road. So, um, you know, 17, that's, you know, that, so that steel player went to my dad and my dad said, so what's going on, what's going on with, with, uh, with Mike? He says, oh, oh, I've been talking to him. He wants to go on the road. Yeah. That's what he wants. And uh, uh, long story short, my dad knew a guy uh, in Detroit who managed a bunch of bands. He had run across this guy through the work that he did with all the Nashville artists, right? Yeah. And uh, so he knew this guy and he called him and said, look, my kid's playing guitar and he, he wants to go on the road. And the guy said, well, I got a guy right now that's got a record out and he's doing well. I mean, he did have a, a record that was doing well in Michigan and Ohio in that area. Yeah. And uh, he said, we can have him come down because he's, he's putting a band together right now. So why don't you bring, bring the kid down and we'll do an audition. Oh, I went and auditioned with him, got the got the gig, and my, you know, my parents dropped me off in Detroit with my mother crying. <laughs> <laughs> see you later. <laughs> my dad's saying, "Yeah, getting rid of me, right?" He's saying, "See you later." And my mother's bawling, saying, "No, oh, he's my baby." And my dad's saying, "Shut up, Lois. He'll be fine. He's, my <laughs> <laughs> he's almost a man. He'll be good. He's seventeen. Yeah, yeah, exactly. When he comes home, he'll be a man. Yeah, exactly. So he just basically threw me to the wolves. You know, let me go. So what was that? like in that first did it feel like that was your first real i guess pro experience for you oh yeah yeah, yeah absolutely that was it um but it was a funny experience because i you know like i was 17 and then a few months later turning 18 and uh, you know i, I was fr I, I didn't even finish high school so i, I was you know uh, the last year, I just didn't go to high school. My mom, mom and dad were both working, and they didn't know that I wasn't going because oh, yeah. they were gone all day. Yeah. They'd come home and say, "How was school? It was great, you know, mm -hmm. yeah, whatever." And then, of course, when I got my marks, and, you know, and I got twelve in math and fifteen in geography, they said, "What's going on?" <laughs> <laughs> I guess you have to be there. Yeah, you yeah. have to show up once in a while. You can't just sit and play guitar all day. So, yeah. Anyway, I ended up on the road with these guys, a bunch of guys. Uh, who lived in, in the Detroit area, but they were all from West Virginia, uh, Kentucky, right. uh, Arkansas, um, stuff like that, you know, the, the Southern states. So yeah. all these Southern guys who are all 10, 12 years older than me. And, um, you know, my idea was that I was going to go on the road and learn how to play from these guys, yeah. you know, from guys that were older and more experienced. And uh, it, it didn't quite turn out that <laughs> way. <laughs> they, they were there to chase girls and I, I was 
you know, like they, they would party all night and uh, I'd wake up at eight in the morning because I was just a kid out of high school and I didn't drink. I'd go down to the bar because the bars opened at eight in the morning and, and uh, in, in different states, yeah. depending upon the state you're in. I'd go down there, my guitar and amp were there. I'd sit there and play guitar all day. Oh, yeah. And they'd come down at like two in the afternoon when they got up and say, what the hell are you doing? And I said, I'm doing my job, man. I'm practicing. Yeah. Said, no, 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 no. That's not what this is about. <laughs> <laughs> I went, well, it is for me. I don't know about you. But anyway, I got various kinds of educations from from those guys. Oh, I bet. As you can well imagine, yeah. Well, still at that age, being that disciplined and wanting to play and not get caught up in this, you know, other stuff that was going on. Yeah. Um, it, you know, that's pretty interesting as well. I mean, that's dedication, even at that age. Yeah, it, it just, I, I just didn't, I didn't know any better. I was pretty naive, but I just was there thinking, well, I got a chance to play guitar. I want to play guitar. Yeah. And I want to learn everything I can learn. And I, I mean, you know, and the drummer uh, that played in my dad's band ended up a few months after uh, I first went on, uh, I had been on the road for a few months. He ended up in that band with me because right. we needed a drummer. The drummer left and I said, well, what about the kid that played with my dad? And he said, sure, yeah, you, you think he's good? Get him. So we got him. And uh, him and I used to go down and we'd sit there and, you know, try and play jazz tunes or bossa novas or pop tunes or yeah. Stevie Wonder tunes. You know, and and uh, just the two of us, guitar and drums, all day long, right? Yeah. And then play at night. Uh, you know, uh, have have dinner and have a nap and go play it, and then go to bed, get up in the morning, go back to the bar and play all day. It's you know, it's a common thing. I I talk about it. It's, it's back then you didn't have those distractions like every kid has now, which no. you could hop on the internet and you could be, you know, faced. And I mean, that was your internet basically. Mm -hmm. um, that was you playing a video game or mm -hmm. whatever way you want to look at it. Um, Absolutely right. And you wonder if, you know, if you were a young kid now, you know, what type of, you know, do, do you have that same discipline when there's so many other things to, to drag you away? Yeah, or do you have the incentive? There is yeah. no, you know, like the, that's the, not a, you know, it, it, life changes and you got to, you know, understand uh, that, that it does and it's not going to be the same for, uh, you know, f uh, the, the f kids that would be my kids or, or grandkids or something. But, yeah, um, yeah it, the, the incentive is not there to become, for example, a great oboe player. <laughs> yeah. Maybe there's a lot of guitar players and a lot of drummers and, you know, but like, like things, orchestral instruments, that, that's one thing a lot of people worry about. Like, what's the incentive to become a great bassoon player or, a, yeah. you know, in, in the symphony? Like, there isn't any. No. Because they got, you can push a button and there's, there's a bassoon, there's a bo an oboe, there's a whatever you want, right? So that's that's a tricky one, and and yeah, if with all those other distractions, would you spend all that time playing the guitar? Maybe, maybe or probably not, you know. Yeah. But it's all there was. Yeah. So that it's irrelevant in a way. Yeah, and and again, like I was alone. I was out there, you know, with three other guys, but they're all older than me, and I don't really have that much in common with them, right? Yeah. So I just go down to the bar and play all day, and and play anything, like literally yeah. anything, I try and play anything, and a lot of it was horrible, I'm sure, but. You know, some things, you know, you, you, it's trial and error. You stumble across one good idea and, and you get excited and that, that keeps you going for, a, you know, a week or two weeks or a yeah. month. And then you, you stumble across another idea and that keeps you going and, and you get, uh, you know, you start to build up, you know, some skills, I guess, basically. Yeah. So where'd you go from, from that band? Where was your next, uh, well, there was, there were three years. Uh, of living in Detroit and playing with various bands like show bands, country bands, uh, uh, you know, rock bands, yeah. you know, like like uh, rock bands like uh, Green's Clearwater, the play tunes like that, or, or the Beatles, or you know, or, or yeah. you know that kind of that kind of uh, not heavy metal or anything like that, but that kind of rock and roll. Yeah. And uh, so I played with you know this guy managed various bands and I played. Uh, he'd just stick me with whoever needed a guitar player for three months or six months or whatever. And uh, that happened for three years. And then I realized, well, uh, for a number of reasons, I didn't want to live in the United States and I didn't want to be an American citizen. Nothing wrong with either one of those things, but I just want, I realized that Canada is a different place and I like it. It's, yeah. I wanted to go home. I was lonely for home, right? And so I, I came home and... Um, and then I, you know, quickly realized um, there's nothing to do here in Chatham. Yeah. <laughs> there's nothing. So if I'm going to do anything, I have to go to Toronto because that's the only place in Canada where there's a real, 
industry, music industry with yeah. like, you know, recording studios and, you know, uh, record companies, publishing companies, musicians, singer songwriters, and, and records being made and, and all kind of stuff. So I, I migrated to, uh, to Toronto and, um, got, uh, you know, again, you know, it's, there's always, it's funny how, how there's always people along the way and I, I can't count how many, uh, I can only mention a few of the names, but because, you know, we're not going to talk for that long, but there's always people that come back in your life that were in your life before yeah. that, that you may have met ex- accidentally, like, um, that help you. Like, for example, I came to Toronto and, and I only, the only person I knew was that guy, Gary Buck, that my dad had played with for, yeah. for a few months. So I called Gary and he was, he was a pretty big time Canadian producer. He had had a big hit in the States um, a few years before that and um, as, as an artist, but he was producing a lot of records and he knew a lot of people. And so I called and said, Gary, you know, I've been working in, in Detroit for three years and doing this and doing that. And, and I, I, I want to move to Toronto. And do you know anybody that I could uh, find a gig with? And he, he said, yeah, I got a friend. He's looking for, for a guitar player right now, a guy named Ron McLeod, who had a TV show in Hamilton. Yeah. And so I, I you know, called him. I said, Gary told me to call you. And he said, yeah, come on down, audition. So I did it, got that gig, and uh, did that for a year, just under a year with him. And then that gave me the courage to move to Toronto. Yeah. All right? Yeah. And, and Yeah. And so I... You know, I actually moved to Port Credit, <laughs> which was close enough to Toronto for me. Yeah. Because I didn't want to live in the big city. That was the thing. The other thing I wanted, I grew up in a little town. I still wanted that kind of atmosphere. Yeah. Because that was the lifestyle I was used to, right? So it was just a little tiny town, but it was 20 minutes away from downtown Toronto at the time. Yeah. So it's not anymore. It's about an hour and a half. Not not that they moved the town. It's just driving. <laughs> <laughs> there's that many more cars. And no no more no more pavement. But you know a thousand times as many cars. So yeah. uh, uh, but then it was close to Toronto as far as time was uh, time goes. And uh, you know, I moved to Port Credit and you know worked with other people. Um, the, the gig with Ron McLeod ended. Ended up working with Ronnie Hawkins. Worked with uh, Dallas Harms, uh, had my own band for a while, yeah. um, and then during some somewhere during that period, which you know would be, you know, because if I was in Detroit for three years, so when I came back, I was twenty, and I turned twenty-one, playing in, at a bar in Oakville, yeah. and uh, uh, then uh, it was funny. I, again, like it's, it's funny how people come back into your life that are that end up being uh, important influences or mentors or whatever you know whatever they are are just friends because really good friends but uh, one guy we were talking about um, before you push the record button was uh, uh, one of the sweetest guys I know Stevie Smith who's a steel guitar player yeah. that we both admire and uh, um, I ran into Stevie somewhere and uh, he said hey man how you doing you know because I had met him in the states yeah when we were both down there playing he was playing with another band and that, that the same manager okay, yeah. managed, right? He was yeah. with another band, and I saw him with a couple different different people. We never played together then. We did jam a little. We did some some matinees together and stuff like that, just playing and having fun. And I just I knew he was a you know, absolutely amazing steel guitar player, and a beautiful guy, and a beautiful musician. And and his brother's a great bass player. So I ran into them, and uh, that was after I was with Hawkins, and after actually I played with Gary Buck for a while. And then uh, um, before I played with Dallas, I, I had my own band for yeah. a little while. And I had those guys in my band, Steve and Greg. And uh, uh, so, the, and the, again, we've been friends ever since, right? We've been yeah. as close as brothers can be, basically. Yeah. So uh, that's like my extended family. So I, that, you know, one thing led to another, to another, to another. And then uh, uh, in that area somewhere, because uh, Steve and Greg, and uh, a couple other people I had met were already doing some, some little country records in yeah. Toronto. And they said, hey, do you want to do some of these sessions with us? And I said, sure, yeah, why not? And I'd been in a studio two or three times, about three times maybe in my life by the, at that point, and uh, uh, didn't have a clue, <laughs> you know, didn't know anything. Because yeah. it's, it's another world. Yeah, it's totally different. Yeah, yeah it's totally different than playing live, you know, in anybody's band. And uh, so I, I, uh, I said, sure, you know, uh, you know, again, naive as, as uh, green as you can be. 
and started doing sessions for this record company that was in Toronto at the time. Uh, it was called Marathon Records. Yeah, uh, I remember them. Yeah, we used to affectionately call it Rush Records. Yeah. Because, uh, you know, it was like, just get through it as fast as you can was the mandate, right? Yeah. But, but, I sound like a five-year-old, but, <laughs> or a 12-year-old, but, but uh, at, at, at the time, uh, it was an opportunity to be in a recording studio with good musicians and, and a real, real recording studio with a, a good engineer and find out, oh, wow, I don't sound as good as I thought I did. And then kind of learn how, uh, how, uh, how things get put together yeah. and how you make, you know, how you make a record and how you play parts and how you come up with ideas, uh, how you put things together, how, so, how, how you take turns, you know, somebody says, okay, so like, especially in those days when you're in a hurry all the time, it's like, Okay, so uh, the steel guitar played the intro on the last tune. The guitar player's got to play the intro on this one, you know, or the piano or something. You know, so yeah. you, you got the intro, you got the fills in the first verse, he's got the fills in the chorus, and I got the solo, and he's got the, you know, and then the next tune, it's, you know, he's switch got to yeah. you know, switch it up, and you just keep going around and around, so it's not always boring. And that was kind of my initiation into that world, and then, uh, you know, it, uh, it evolved, uh, and, and uh, you know, a couple of years later, I stumbled into, uh, as I told you earlier, what I call the working with the big shots, which was a whole completely other di different world. Yeah. So how did that come about? How did your kind of your first call into that? It was, again, just uh, an accident. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it was like, uh, you know, I've, I've had, um, you know, my dear sweet dad used to say, more good luck than good management, you know, and <laughs> knock on wood and say thank you. But I mean, the, the truth is I, I did some demos. I was doing, you know, playing bars still and uh, playing some of the, on some of those little country records and then a few rock and roll records, a very few. And then I, uh, I did some demos at a studio for a, a folk singer named Tom Gallant, uh, mm -hmm. Canadian uh, singer-songwriter who's very talented. Had a show on CBC for a, a couple summers and uh, just some demos for him at this little studio. But the engineer um, who had, was at that studio uh, worked for uh, worked for the for the studio, which was owned by a guy named Ben McPeak. And that that engineer was also a really good bass player. Oh yeah. And I didn't even know it when I did that demo because he was just engineering. He wasn't playing bass. But he was a heck of a good bass player too, like incredibly good and a really good engineer. So uh, we hit it off. His name is Jim Morgan, and he's still a dear friend. And I like, <laughs> and I thank him every day. Trust me. And and uh, and uh, he, the man that owned the studio, was a, a gentleman named Ben McPeak. And Ben uh, had been a was a big was still a big deal. And this was like. Um, 19, we're up at 1975 now. Yeah. So, you know, a lot of time has gone by because I went on the road in 69. Oh, yeah. So uh, this is 1975, and uh, Ben had been a big deal in the jingle uh, industry um, in the 50s, 60s, and, uh, and even uh, the, the, you know, up to the, the mid-70s. And he had also been the guy that uh, did orchestrations, uh, orchestral arrangements for uh, a lot of the big... Canadian rock bands like the Guess Who and, yeah. and you know, all those kind of Stampeders and all those kind of people. If they needed a, a you know strings and orchestral instruments, Ben McBeak was the guy that did that work. Yeah, a very talented man and a sweet man. And um, um, so anyway, Jim went to him and said, "Look, you should hire this kid. I worked with him last night, and he's really good. I think you know, I think he's good. You should hire him." And uh, so I, I did. Uh, well, you'll you know, like this. Uh, the, I got a call to do a. a, a from a lady who was Ben's contractor, mm -hmm. contracted musicians and singers for him. And she, 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 she said, I'm looking for Mike Francis. I said, yeah, that, that's who I am. She said, uh, well, um, you just worked the other night at, the, at Captain Audio, the stu which was the recording studio with uh, Jim Morgan. I said, yep. And she said, okay, so I got the right guy. And uh, she said, uh, uh, would you like to do a jingle? Are you available? She said, not would you like to, but are you available to do a jingle? next Tuesday morning with Ben McPeak, who owns the studio. And, and I said, what's a jingle? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's how stupid I was, right? What's a jingle? Okay. Uh, and she said, you know, like a TV commercial or a radio, radio commercial. And, and then, and of course, the light bulb went off. I said, oh, yeah, right. There's music in those things. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like I never thought, you know, that there were live people there playing, but obviously there have to be. Yeah. 
especially back in those days, there were no computers or machines. Right? So she said, it's a jingle. I said, oh, okay, yeah, 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 sure, I can do that. 10 o'clock Tuesday morning. Okay, so I show up at the studio and, uh, and I do it, and it's a total disaster because I'm in way over my head. Yeah. Like I just went from, you know, playing with a bunch of really good friends who are really nice guys who didn't have any more experience than I did, though. Yeah. And we were all, you know, like not schooled and not didn't have any structure to what we did really didn't we were just grasping at straws right and and you know, flailing away and walked into a room full of guys who were had been doing it for anywhere from 10 to 20 to 25 30 years already yeah and were veterans and were like the best musicians in the world as good as anybody on the planet guys like mo kaufman guido uh-huh. basso you know, Eugene O'Mara, Laurie Bauer, and, and uh, you know, Tom says, yeah, and Doug Riley and Eric Robertson, and then Brian Barlow, and the list goes on and on and on, yeah. right? These guys are all geniuses. They all grew up uh, studying music. They're all schooled. They're all, they, they've all been doing the studio thing for years. They're all experienced. Yeah. They're fast, they're brilliant, and they're, you know, like everything they play is amazing. And I'm like a two-year-old. Yeah. You know, because I couldn't read music. That was the big problem, the biggest problem. But the other thing is, I, I was still like, I, you know, like these guys are all geniuses, right? So did you realize that before you came in, but or no. once you got in there, it was like, holy oh, crap. <laughs> when I walked in, it was like, holy crap. Yeah. Oh, no. What, what have I got myself into here? Yeah. And, you know, but then I, I, I found, uh, then, then, you know, I thought, I walked away from that thinking, well, that'll never happen again, you know. And a week later, I get a call from the same lady. Uh, her name is Bev Crompton, saying, "Mike, it's Bev Crompton again." I said, "Yeah, can you do a gig uh, for for Ben this Thursday? Uh, you know, at two o'clock." And I said, "I said to her, um, uh, he knows I can't read music, right?" And she doesn't he? And she said, "Oh yeah, trust me, he knows." <laughs> <laughs> and I said, "Okay, okay," because like the, the thing was back then, you were never it, nobody ever gave you a chord chart and said just make something up. Yeah. It was all written out. It was all written out, right? Like even the rhythm parts were written out. Oh, yeah. This is the rhythm I want you to play, and it has to be that way because it's going with the percussion and something else or something. Or, or you're playing this melody, and it's with the strings or the, you know, yeah. with the violins or, or, the, or the cellos or, or whatever the heck it is, and those guys aren't going to screw it up. Yeah. They're going to be perfect. So when you mess it up, you're going to look like an idiot, right? And so, you know, I, w- I said, well, if he wants me, I'll go to it. So I, I found out uh, very quickly that, that Ben McPeak was one of those guys who uh, had given a lot of people a chance. Oh, yeah. If he if he saw you and heard you play and thought you had something going on, maybe yeah. he would give you a chance for a while. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. But you know, I've also figured out really quickly that it wasn't going to be for a long while. Yeah. You know, unless he saw a lot of improvement real fast. Yeah. And and all the other people around me too. Like I realized, like in, unless I start. Unless I figure out how to catch up, how to try and catch up with these guys, I'm going to be going real fast. Yeah. And uh, I had a, you know a couple real good kicks in the in the behind uh, from a few of the, the uh, veterans who took me aside and said, "Look, you know, like you need to learn learn to read music. You need to do this. You need to do that." Da 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 da. And I'm, yeah, yeah, okay, okay. I, I know, but I don't know how to do it. <laughs> Yeah, you know, and I had one guy say, "Okay, here's the deal," and he, you know, a guy named Jack Zaza, who was like the godfather of studio musicians in Toronto, and he could play about 15 instruments, uh-huh. and, you know, all amazing, like everything from the spoons to the uh, oboe and the saxophone, and you know, and yeah. violin and accordion, and you name it. I can't think of anything that he couldn't play. Yeah. So you know, he was the uh, the bass player, the electric bass player for you know a few years when the electric bass first came along in the studio. So I mean, he just did everything. He took me aside at one of Ben's sessions. He said, "Hey kid, come on outside. I want to talk to you." I said, "Yeah, okay." And uh, he says, "Look, uh, do you want to do this for a living?" I said, "Yes, sir, Mr. Saza." You know, like, <laughs> and he said, "Well, you got to learn to at least read eighth notes. You know, if you're and you got to learn to keep up." And I said, "Yeah, I know, I know, but I don't know how." He said, "Okay, well, you got a metronome?" I said, "Yes, sir, I do." He said, okay. He, he said, go get a piece of paper and a pencil. So I ran back inside and got a piece of paper and a pencil. He, he wrote down, he said, he, you know, he, this is a trumpet book and this is a clarinet book. And sit, they're all exercises. They're written in the same register as the guitar. Yeah. So it's perfect for you. He said, but they're all exercises, so you, it's impossible to memorize them because there's just millions of exercises. And sit down with a metronome and learn to play, to play your way through these books. 
And so that I did that, and at the same time, I uh, I talked through talking to another friend I had met in Toronto when I f- first moved there, who uh, who was a uh, uh, who repaired guitars for a living, but he was also a guitar, good guitar player himself. Mm-hmm. Um, I I got the name of a of a teacher who had been one of the original uh, studio guys in Toronto in the uh, 40s and the 50s and the 60s, right? Yeah, yeah. And he had just retired a few years before that. And he was, he was, uh, he had, he's taught everybody, like from, you know, Dominic Triano and Kim Mitchell and like anybody, uh, just about anybody you can name yeah. this, this guy. His name was Tony Braden. He, he gave lessons to them. And he, he said, so this friend of mine said, call Tony Braden. And, uh, so I, and I had these books in the metronome and I started working at that and I called Tony and I said, look, you know, I, I said, I, I know you have a process and a system and all that kind of stuff. I'm sure you do. I said, but here's what's happening. I'm getting calls from these guys like Ben McPeak and Doug Riley and Eric Roberts and these guys. And I can't read music and I desperately need to learn as fast as I can. Like yesterday, I need to learn to read music yeah. or, or else I'm going to be gone, you know, unless I get it together really fast. And he said, he said, that's okay. You know, he was like Santa Claus. He was in his 60s at the time. And he was a sweetheart. And he, you know, I was just a young punk. But he said, yeah, come on down to my, he said, well, can you come next Tuesday or something? Whatever it was, you know, I'll say Tuesday morning. I said, sure. He said, come down and uh, we'll sit down and figure out how to help you. And so I said, okay. So I went and uh, uh, it was, we sat and he said, let's just play. So he played a little bit and he said, well, you can play. You got, you know, you got the natural skills. But he said, um, he said, let me ask you a question. He said, play me a, play me a C sharp on the, on the high E string. And I went, um, oh, geez, uh, count it up. There it is. He said, okay, play us, play us a D flat on the, on the B string, which is the same note as a C sharp, as you know. Mm-hmm. And I, I went, oh, geez, oh, okay, D flat, C sharp, C sharp. And I, oh, there it is. Yeah, okay. But he said, okay, play a C sharp on the G string. And I went, oh, God, I don't look for it. So he said, okay, that's enough. He said, the problem you got, the biggest problem you got, is you don't know where the notes are on the neck. Mm-hmm. And how can you read music if you don't know where the notes are, are on the instrument? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Which is exactly right. Yeah. Right? He identified the problem immediately. And uh, he said, so here's, here's the deal. I can help you, I can, and I, I know how to get you started and give you a real, a, a real like quick learner's course, you know, like a, a real head start here and get you moving quick if, if you want to. And I said, I'll do anything. He said, okay, here's what you got to do. And he showed me how to do it. And he said, you've you got to learn where everything is on the neck off the, of the guitar, and then you got to be able to apply that to the page. And so uh, he gave me a bunch of exercises and showed me how to play scales in ways that I had never, I never played scales. So that was when I, I developed the, I fell in love with playing scales basically because of him. Yeah. And uh, uh, he taught me, he gave me a bunch of exercise and a bunch of, a bunch of different ways of playing scales and looking at scales and, and looking at the neck of the guitar and, and a bunch of drills, things that would basically beat it into my brain where all the notes were on the neck. And uh, so I, I, uh, I just, I literally, um, my wife, who you know, Debbie, she uh, she got up early and went to work every day. She was up at 6 and gone at 6.30. She used to put a, I was playing bars at night still, and I uh, I used to, she'd put on a, a pot of coffee, and I would sit all day and drink coffee and play scales and play these exercises in these, the clarinet and the, tr- and the trumpet books yeah. and with a metronome and just work and work and work and work. And uh, what happened was it was it was you know again the next thing that happened to me was everybody in town all the all the writers all the the, the guys that were busy and were the big shots all hired me once oh yeah once yeah not again not twice once, once. and I got the message really clear it was like the the sort of uh, the understanding in the industry was well if Ben's hiring he 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 must know what he's doing yeah. But I found out later that Ben was the kind of guy that was the, not the kind of guy. He was a, a guy that uh, that was very gracious, and he had mentored a lot of other musicians and singers too, and gave them chances. And uh, so these guys didn't know that I couldn't read. And yeah. As soon as I did the session, they found out right away. Oh, he couldn't can't keep up. There's no time for a guy that can't keep up, right? Yeah. And so that again beat it into my head even more that I got to learn to do this. 
So what would, what happened was a couple months would go by and I would do the odd thing here and there for Ben. And then one of those guys that I worked for once would be desperate because all the other you know good guys that were on their list were busy. And they'd, somebody would say, well, I guess we've got to hire that idiot. Francis, you know, I guess he's the only guy left, you know, you know, the only guy that hasn't drowned or whatever. So, you know, pull him on the boat and let's get him to, you know, we'll get him to play guitar. And I'd, I'd go in and I'd been working and working and working. And they were, um, all of them were nice enough uh, that after the session, like they'd, they'd say, Hey man, you're better than you were last time. Like you've, you've improved. And I, uh, I told them, I said, I'm killing myself trying. They said, well, keep it up. Because you, you you've already improved yeah. since we saw you a couple months ago, and then a couple months later, they somebody'd be in a bind, and I'd get that call, and they'd say, "Hey, man, you're getting a little better." And I'd say, "Well, I'm like I'm killing myself literally. <laughs> I was, I'm desperate." And I was taking the lessons with Tony Braden, and uh, I only what happened was I, I only took lessons from him for about six months, yeah. and in that by the end of that six months, I couldn't really read great, but I could read enough. And I started getting busy enough that I didn't have time to take lessons anymore. So uh -huh. I never, that was the only time I took lessons in my life. And it was just specifically teach me how to, how to read, read to, yeah. how to learn to read music, how to figure this out. Right. Yeah. It was like, cause it, to me, it was like reading the Chinese newspaper, you know, yeah. it's like it was impossible. Right. Um, and really hard when you're 23 turning 24 and you, you already have been playing in bar bands for a long time and you feel like, well, I can play, but. But you can't. I mean, you're you're still fooling yourself. You can't. Yeah. You can't play nothing. I didn't know anything at the time because, you know, like I was so far out of my element. It was, you know, I, I wasn't hanging on. Uh, you know, I wasn't looking over the cliff. I was hanging off of the cliff. You know, yeah. Just barely hanging on. You know, on these sessions because these guys were so much so far ahead of me. So that's how it all got started for me. Like the whole uh, uh, my ritual of of you know playing scales I played for a couple hours before you got here today I played scales uh -huh. that's what I do that yeah. you know and I've learned the value of it and I've, I've, I like it. there's a bunch of reasons why it's very valuable guys some a lot of people don't understand it um, but the people that do and that do it it makes a big difference in your playing and they know why you know and they, they yeah. know you know the, the the other benefits there's a lot of benefits that you don't see on the surface put it that way and uh, Anyway, so that's what started that whole process. And then just the fact, like, I've always, I got into the ritual of practicing even more. Yeah, then you're already practicing a lot. Than I already yeah, was. Yeah. because, But I had so much to learn. Like, the, the thing was, when I stepped into that world, it was like going from a, a, a paddle boat you know, in the, in uh, in the in the middle of a, in a canoe or something or whatever, in in the, in the middle of a, of a little creek, to to uh, somebody plunking you down in, in the middle of NASA, saying, "Okay, now you're going to run the operations that, that get the rocket to the moon." Yeah, you know, like you're in charge of getting this sucker up to the moon, right? <laughs> yeah, like that, that's what it was like. It was that that much of a jump, and I, I was you know so far out of my element, it was unbelievable. And I realized how good these guys all were, and they were because they were schooled. Yeah. And I wasn't, so I, I had so much catching up to do, so that I just, I, I just got into the ritual or the routine of beating myself up, trying to just trying to catch up to these guys, and keep up with them, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, how long do you think it took before you felt like you were pretty comfortable? I still in, don't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I still think I suck. Oh, well, that's not true. <laughs> uh, that that old friend that I told you that that was the steel player in my dad's band. He, uh, I hadn't seen I haven't seen him for you know about I don't know. We've stayed in touch a little bit, but I hadn't seen him for Jesus fifteen years. And I saw him last summer, and uh, and so now we've been in contact more and uh, than, than we had previously. And. And he sent me an email a while ago, and he said, "So, so I, you know, he's all he's interested in, in uh, because a lot of people are always interested in, like you said, I've, I've been lucky. I've had a, an, a, a really, I've been lucky. I've, I've had a, a very nice career." Yeah. And um, he said, says, "I'd love to hear some of the stuff you've played on." Like he's, you know, he said, "Can you send me some some of the stuff you've played on?" And I said, "You know something, man, I I never listen to the stuff I've played on, and I'm not sure I like it that much." <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not, like I really don't I don't you know like I don't think that much of anything that I've ever done like there's a lot of guys that are so much better than me that I don't really feel like I've you know uh, that I've ever arrived but it, to, to be in a, to answer you seriously um, it took me a year from the time I started trying to learn to read to to be comfortable at it 
yeah. to, to be like competent, put yeah. it that way, just, just competent. And that's not like the guys that, like the violin players or even the, the piano players and the, all, the, all the guys who just, they, somebody put a chart in front of them and they don't even look at it. They just pick up their instrument and start playing it. Yeah. Like well, they don't even think about it. Yeah. It's just automatic for them, right? And it, so I was still struggling, but I could struggle in a competent way. Yeah. <laughs> and then it took me another year. So I was two years before I felt like I could walk into anything and not be terrified. Yeah. Because I was, for the first six months or a year, I was terrified. Like I used to, I used to go to the studio every gig at least an hour early, hoping that the music would be there. Oh yeah, so you could run over it. So yeah. I could look at it and, and figure out, what is that, what, what is that? Because like those guys, they, they look at a rhythmic figure, you know, da 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 ba 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 you know, and they, it just comes out of them. Yeah. They look at it and they just spit it out. And then, you know, they look at a melodic figure, do 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 whatever the heck it is, all over the place, and they just spit it out, right? Yeah. And I sit there going, ah, da, 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 that's a, no, that's a B, da, 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 oh, gee, oh, uh, you know, like trying to find what, what note is that and what's the rhythm of it and what's the, yeah. you know, what's it supposed to sound like? And uh, it was terrifying. Yeah, it's, I can imagine. I, I mean, well, yeah. maybe I can't imagine, but, um, but obviously they saw something in you that they, well, they, you know, which was great. I mean, I think we talked about this earlier, just being able to judge whether you know someone has something more in them or not, right? Yeah. And uh, obviously they saw that the potential was certainly, you know, it just needs a little... Somebody did. A lot yeah. of guys were really kind to me uh, as well. And then the other thing is, like, as I always say to people, I don't know if they liked me or felt sorry for me. But, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, a, a lot of guys... A lot of other other musicians put it that way. Um, um, were really kind and really uh, generous to me, yeah. and helped me. Like you know, I uh, can't tell you how many times, uh, you know, you know, guys have come over to me in the middle of the, came over came over to me in the middle of a session, and whispered in my ear and said, "Hey, all that is is just pop 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 That's all it is. Mm-hmm. Don't worry about it." You know, or, you know, in one case, a piano player came over and he heard me struggling and we had the same, same part we were playing and there was like a bar and a half where it was really complicated and I'm struggling with it. It was a jingle and they go by really quickly, a jingle does, because yeah. you only got an hour and you got three tracks to record and you got to get in and out. And uh, he, the piano player came over to me and he says, take off your phones. And I said, okay, I took off my phones. He whispers in my ear, he says, I've got these two bars covered. You don't have to play there. They won't even, they won't even notice that you're not playing. So just don't play, okay? I said, okay. He said, play, play before that and after it. Just don't play those two bars. I said, okay. And we did it the next time, ran it down, and, and we recorded it. And it was like, perfect, guys. That was a take. Great. And I looked over at him and said, thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And he said, yeah, 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 don't worry about it. And he became one of my best friends and one of the guys that hired me for more gigs than I can count. Uh, he was a writer too, but uh, Eric Robertson is his name, a sweetheart yeah. of a guy. But... Uh, Anyway, it was just, yeah, it was a lot of stress but, and a lot of pressure. But at the same time, I didn't have any other options because I didn't have an education, period. You know, I didn't finish high school. So it's, you know, it's, it's kind of do or die. It's, that, yeah, yeah. It's, it's pump and gas or, or, you, or it's walking in, to, like for me, because I didn't even know that world existed. Yeah. You know, like I'm backing up a little bit. Like to me, it was wa- like walking into a, uh, a dream, like a fairy tale. Yeah. or Disney World or something. It was, it was like that. Like you're working with the best musicians, the best writers, uh, the best recording engineers in the best recording studios in Canada, which are as good as anywhere in the world. Yeah. All these people and the best producers, right? And so you're like, everything is incredible. And it was just an absolute, I was just stunned, first of all, and in shock. And then once I got over being in shock, I realized how great it was. And I wanted that. I looked at that and you know I looked at all these guys and said I want that I want to be one of those guys. Yeah. You know like that's what I want I you know like that's when I realized that's what I want to be. And that's when I also re- you know cuz I never really liked playing uh bars that much. I didn't like playing live. Yeah. And I and I'm the most boring person in the world to watch. I'm not a performer. I'm terrible at it. you know just absolutely horrible at that. It's a, it's about the instrument to me and about playing yeah. and about what you hear. 
not what you see, right? Yeah. And so the recording studio is the perfect world for that because it's about what you hear, not what you see. Yeah. You know, and, uh, and, and it's magnified times a thousand because everything you play, everybody else in the room is going to hear again. Yeah. You know, three or four times until everybody's, you know, satisfied that it's right. And so it better, be, what you play better be right like everybody else is, right? So explain to me and, you know, people listening what those sessions were actually like back then. Because probably, obviously, different than recording now. It was really, a, you know, you were turning out lots of stuff. I mean, it was... Yeah. And so it was basically... Everything was in blocks, right? Time-wise, in, in the studio, you'd have a. How, how did that all work? Uh, well, you you know, it, it depends on on uh, the type of gig it was, right? Yeah. Like a jingle is is, is an hour. That's it. You know, you I, so you better be able to get it together quick. No matter no matter how hard the music is, you better yeah. be able to get it get together right now, because and as I said, we have three versions to record. You know. Um, a 60, a 30, and then sometimes an, a, um, a second version of uh, a just-in-case version, you know. Yeah, it's not like, because it's like Pearl Tools now, you just chop up a 30-second version or whatever, and no. you have to make sure you you cover all your bases. Yeah, no, this is live to tape. So this yeah. is like, the, sometimes they record a backup version in case, right? Uh, like a different track, a different a different yeah. piece of music. So, so, you, so that's an hour. And then would... How many people would be involved in that? Maybe with singers and everything, or it would be just musicians and singing after? Mostly, the singers always were after, and the voiceover yeah. was after. But the jingles were always, um, like, you know, it's the the first five years at least, maybe even the first ten years, but the first five years at least that I did those sessions with those people in that world, it was uh, I say, I'd say seven out of ten sessions I did uh, were there were fifty sixty musicians on them. Wow. Uh, the other three would be, would be a rhythm section with a, a, a couple horns or, or, you know, just a rhythm section. If it was a, a folk or a country thing or a rock and roll thing or something like that, you know. Yeah. But, but, you know, without synthesizers and computers and all that, to get a big sound, you had to have a lot of people. Yeah. Right? And, and if you wanted orchestral instruments, I mean, you don't get one violin, you get 15. And you get, you know, 10 or 12 uh, violas and, and five, six cellos. You know, and that's just the strings, right? And then you got the yeah. horns, and then you got the rhythm section guys, and the percussionists, and this and that and that. And, you know, so it, it was, you know, so you'd go from, you know, a typical day would be doing a, one jingle or two jingles, uh, which were an hour each, and then in between that was a, a three-hour uh, call for a TV show, you know, like uh, the background music on a TV show, yeah. or uh, or a film, yeah. with their, which are in three-hour chunks. So you might do a, a double session, like you know, like lots of times I would do a nine o'clock jingle, and, and uh, then run from that studio to the next studio, and it would be ten to one and two to five of uh, two three hour chunks of a session for a, a, a film or the background music for a TV show like Street Legal, or uh, or the pre record for the Tommy Hunter show, yeah. or Fraggle Rock, which mm -hmm. I did, you know, or something like that, or you know Sesame Street, one of those things, and then at night. Uh, because the the big money or the the bread and butter money was made during the day, so everybody did uh, albums and records at night. So then right. you at night you'd go you'd go somewhere for dinner. Then you you'd go do a record, which would be anywhere from a, a, a three to a six hour call. So you're working from like seven to ten or seven till one a.m. Wow! And then you go home, you sleep for six hours, you get up, you get, get your butt in the car, and you get back downtown for the nine o'clock jingle. You know, and that starts the day again. And so you're, you know, you're running from this studio at, at nine o'clock. You're done, you know, and you're, you're asking the guy, can, you know, for a favor. Like once I got really rolling, you're asking, you know, you're saying, look, my, actually what happened was uh, my wife uh, became my business manager. Oh, good. Okay. And she, she had a really good job, but uh, um, through uh, talking to our accountant, we found that uh, we were better off if she stayed home and helped me yeah. help my career and she was more than willing to do that and happy to do that and then she's the athlete as I told you in the family so mm -hmm. we were talking about this earlier she's she's the uh, uh, you know um, it, if I could have been an athlete I would want I'd want to be my wife because she can pick up anything and, and play yeah. immediately like a ball and a racket and a ball and a bat and a glove and whatever she she's great she's good to go yeah yeah she's she's just she's a natural i'm the opposite uh it's all going on in my head and it's it's music it's not anything you know it's not anything athletic for sure so anyway she stayed home and uh 
um, because she was home, um, you got to understand like these these people that book, uh, especially when they're booking 50, 60 musicians, right? Yeah. For a, a recording session, and at first it was the, the first year or so it was like, can you, it's it's Friday, you'd get a call, can you do something next Tuesday or Wednesday, and then it was. It's Friday. Can you? It, it, it's Monday morning. We need you. Oh, yeah. And then it was. It's Thursday afternoon. We need you for tomorrow morning. Oh yeah. And then and then it got to be. It's Friday morning. We need you for this afternoon. Yeah. You know. So it got less and less. You know. Uh, time. Uh, less and less lead time, basically. And what what happens is when these people are booking that many musicians and they have to do it. You know, they're on the phone all day booking booking people for different gigs. These yeah. contractors. Um, they don't want to like say as if it's four thirty and they're done at five o'clock. They want to be done at five o'clock and go home. Yeah, they don't want to be looking for a guitar player still at eight o'clock at night. They want to, you know. So my wife would be home, um, not sitting by the phone, but she would just happen to be there, or they'd know if they left a message, she would pick it up with within a half hour. Yeah, always right, because she was always close enough to home, so she would pop in and, and pick up messages, and and they got to also uh, know that the her and I are a really good team. And if she said he'll be there for nine o'clock tomorrow morning, I would be there with, you know, with bells on with, with whatever instruments they told me to bring and, yeah. and I'm ready and ready to go. Right. So they trusted her, they trusted me. And so my, I, I ended up with more work when she started helping yeah. me. Right. Cause no, no cell phones or Again, texting or nothing, no way to kind of, you know, be at a session and grab your phone. Yeah. I can make two o'clock. You'd have to wait until you got home. Yeah. And you'd miss that call. one in the morning and you'd miss the call. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, I used to get calls. This is ridiculous, but I used to get calls like some of the guys that, that uh, did this, did studio work also played jazz at the, in the jazz clubs in Toronto at night. And yeah. they, they'd be doing a gig from nine till 1 a.m. And then they'd be writing the jingle for the, they'd be writing the nine o'clock jingle at 3 a.m. Oh, yeah. And I'd get a phone call from from their contractor, uh, you know, that this was like particularly a guy named Doug Riley, who's a sweet, sweet guy. Uh, unfortunately, he's not with us anymore, but a sweet man. But that was his his approach. His mo that was his the way he did it. And it, I'd get the phone would ring at 3 a.m. and uh, one of us would pick it up, Debbie or I, and and say hi. It's it's oh, hey man, it's Slide, which was Doug, Slide. Mm -hmm. was, they called him Slide because he was a trombone player. Right. Uh, so it's Slide, man. Uh, can uh, can Mike do a jingle with 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 Doc tomorrow morning at nine o'clock at Manta? Yeah, yeah, he can do it. Yeah, okay, you know, okay, great, gotcha. See you later. You know, and, and that's all he wanted. He wanted, you know, he needed to get a band, and, and it was three in the morning. Yeah, <laughs> you know, and he was going to get the first guy that he. I mean, again, the first guy that answered the phone was going to get that gig. He, he, some people would say, "I want this guy." You know, I want Mike Francis or I want so and so or so and so or so. You know, and that's it. Yeah. Uh, so if we can't get that guy, we'll move the session. You know, because that's eventually, you know, uh, people, um, because of circumstances, because of loyalty and because of uh, not, not just loyalty, but just because of familiarity and because of getting the work done. Yeah. Because there's a lot of pressure and, again, a lot of stress, as I said. So, like, the, you know, the, the producer and the writer, they get used to working with a certain person. They want to keep working with that person because they get what they want out of them. Yeah. Right? And whatever instrument he plays, and, or the, him or her. Uh, and uh, and so you know they want that person. And that's the way it is. So they would move sessions around. But also my my wife uh, found out you know got in the habit of saying, look, he can do the nine o'clock jingle, but he you know at Manta, but he's got to be um, at McClear Place or at Sounds Interchange or whatever Eastern for for ten o'clock. Because you know, can you let him out ten minutes early? And they say, yeah, 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 we'll be done ten minutes early. Don't worry about it. And uh, and the ten o'clock session never started on time anyway. Yeah. So it was always started at 10 after, quarter after, especially when there's 50, 60 musicians. It's like, it doesn't ha start exactly at 10 o'clock. It starts as yeah. close as they can, but you know, you got a few minutes to- Yeah, a few minutes to spare. To spare, to, you know, so I could run and literally run, you know, scream up and down the, you know, Spadina Ave in, in Toronto to get from one studio to another. The, uh, yeah, the studios must've been just always set up and ready to go, right? They it must, it they was just, humming. Yeah. It was humming. It was like a beehive. Yeah. And I mean, they, they weren't set up and ready to go, but everything was there yeah. and ready, you, no matter what you needed, if you needed it. And, you know, like it was a, it was a different world. I mean, now the whole world has changed and, uh, and it's, it's not, uh, it, there's no right or wrong. 
mm-hmm. but uh, in my you know for the sake of of the guitar player put it this way or the drummer or or whatever uh, back in those days it was better for us because I mean, first of all this all the studios had their own parking lots oh yeah for the musicians yeah not for the clients this is for the musicians yeah you know so so you guys go park somewhere else and this is you know this is about making music yeah and these guys get first preference and then you know there'd be an assistant at at Manta or at Sounds Interchange or wherever, you know, when I pulled up by the door, said, "Hey, man, how you doing? What's what? Who are you working with?" Because there's like three studios in the, in the building. Yeah. I said, "I'm working with the Eric." Okay, okay, you're in in two. Here, give me give me your couple of guitars and uh, you grab your amp. Let's go. And they'd be there helping you carry your gear in. And uh, you know, it's it's stuff like that. I mean, so yeah. you know, it, it was pretty sweet deal. Oh yeah. You know, pretty pretty nice world. And you know, anything you needed was there for you. Yeah, you know, like those guys were there to help you. The assistants, they were they were parking your car for you because they knew you didn't have time to do it yourself. Yeah, you know, and and then dropping the keys by on the way by, you know, and, and I mean, anything, any piece of gear you needed was there, um, and you know, it just yeah. And then they they set, I mean, they would set sessions up, you know, for 50, 60 musicians. You can't do it, at, you know, if the sessions at ten, they started at seven in the morning or whatever. Yeah, setting that session up, and when that session was done, they started two or three hours before the next one. If they or they had to have two or three hours, they they needed a two hour turnover. Yeah, you know, if it was going to be another big session, that's a big setup. With that yeah, many people. Yeah. yeah, it's a lot of mics and a lot of complications, a lot of things to a lot, a lot of bugs to want you know to iron yeah. out, right? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so you know, would I guess Toronto really was the hotbed for that, right? And you know, Toronto probably L.A. and New York, really, or yeah, Toronto, L.A., New York, uh, Nashville, and Chicago. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, they're, they're different environments yeah. in each city. And, well, in Detroit, you know, had the, Motown had their own run, obviously, too. And, and there was a big scene in Philadelphia for, uh, for 10 or 15 years. You know? And then there's the other offshoots uh, for in the 60s and 70s, like Muscle Shoals and in Memphis, uh, Stax Volt. Yeah. Uh, so there was all those. But, you know, in those cases, there are all different environments, like... Uh, um, the the two that were similar in my mind uh, could because I've you know we've all seen all those DVDs that have been out like yeah. uh, standing in the shadows of Motown and uh, about the whole Motown scene and the musicians and the 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 artists the singers songwriters and all, all the great music and and then there's you know the Wrecking Crew which is uh, about yeah. the LA scene and uh, you know there, there's one about Muscle Shoals one about Stacks and and uh, um, the thing is that. I guess New York, L.A., and Toronto would have been similar in, in the fact that you had to to work steady, to work all the time. Yeah. You had to be all, basically, with which is, it's an impossible thing, but you had to try to be all things to all people. In other words, you, you couldn't just uh, play acoustic guitar. You yeah. Know, or, uh, you, you, you know, you had, and, or you couldn't just play one style of music. You know, you, you had to play, a, you know, any style that they threw in front of you. Yeah. If you wanted to work all the time. If you wanted to work once a month, yeah, you could say this is all I do, and they say, or, you know, once a week or whatever. Sure, yeah, yeah, okay, that's fine. But you're only going to work once a week, so if you need, to, you know, from seeing those DVDs, that was my point. I, I saw like the Wrecking Crew one. It was the same as the world I lived in. Yeah, you know, they did everything. They did jingles and TV shows and films and records, and you know, they were working with more famous people than I was. That I, you know, at, at the time. Yeah. Uh, you know, they were working with Frank Sinatra and, uh, and, and, you know, whatever. I mean, and, uh, you know, the Beach Boys and whatever. And, uh, and, and up here, here, we worked with uh, with our own, you know, uh, kind of set of stars too, you know, like the Alanis Morissettes and, you know, all those kind of people too. Yeah. And, and, you know, uh, anybody, you know, Tommy Hunter and whoever else, whoever else you can name and think of, right? But, I mean, and anything in between. But uh, but we also, we you had to be able to read music, whereas in Nashville that wasn't, an, you know, important like if you could play the right style yeah. and and you know everybody in Nashville can play their ass off I mean there's no question they're all great and, but they're playing it's a country music town yeah and that's that's what it is and that that's fine because that was my background but that's part of what got me in 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 Toronto was in 1975 backing up about 20 minutes or half an hour uh, there was a movie called Urban Cowboy mm-hmm uh, with John Travolta in it, and and it had steel guitar and a lot of a lot of country music in it, and all of a sudden, we they said we need a steel guitar player and we need a, a guy that can play guitar like that those guys in that movie, 
And that, that just happened to be me, and I just happened to be in the right place at the right time oh, yeah. in Toronto. So again, just good luck, not good management. I just happened yeah. to be there. And then they, you know, they started phoning me and saying, can you play a uh, bossa nova thing? Yeah, I can do that. I know what that is. Okay. Can you play rock and roll? Yeah, I played with Ronnie Hawkins. I can play rock and roll. Oh, okay. And then, I, you know, I, yeah. the, the thing I realized quick, too, was uh, that I couldn't just get away with you know, I needed to learn music or learn to read music desperately. <laughs> I needed to learn more about music desperately, uh, about harmony and, and about, you know, how to put things together. But I also needed to learn how to play like, you know, a bunch of other guitar players. Yeah. Um, and, uh, it, you know, if somebody says, I, I want a solo like Clapton, you better be able to play like Clapton. You know, if somebody says, I want a solo like Van Halen or, you know, uh, or I want you to pick up an acoustic and play like James Taylor, you better be able to pick up an acoustic, yeah. play like James Taylor. You know, so, I mean, that was easy for me because I had started by playing the acoustic guitar and yeah. by playing fingerstyle. So that was easy con relatively for me. Yeah. As long as it wasn't written out, as long as they just said, here's the chords, just do what you, and they didn't know much about that music. So that, when it was that kind of situation, that's when it was a lot easier for me because they'd say, well, you know about this stuff. We don't really know what this, you know, what the guitar does in this kind of, kind of music. So just, just do your thing. Yeah. And that was great. But the rest of the time it was like, no, you're doubling the flutes and the, uh, or the saxophones. You better nail it. <laughs> yeah. So I was like, oh yeah. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> so how long did that, I mean, obviously that was a kind of powerhouse time in Toronto and, and that stuff was going on pretty st steady, but it kind of started to fade away at, at some point. Yeah, um, yeah, it always it always does. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it well, it changed in, in, the, in many. You know, like if I feel like I've lived about four different lifetimes. Yeah. So sometimes that's the way I, it feels to me. But like the it changed around me, but it didn't change my world. Like it's uh, you know when the synthesizers and the drum machines and then the computers came along, the Mac first. The you know the, yeah. the, the, um, what was the first Mac that everybody used? Mac Classic. Yeah, yeah, the little one, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, I even had one. I couldn't, just couldn't think of what it was. But um, uh, that started to change. Like, for the first thing to go were the, uh, were the string sections because they could, the, the emulator arrived. Yeah. And then it's in Clavier and, uh, and you know, the, the other machines like that. And so they could duplicate the strings. Yeah. And, and they could, or they could just get a few violins to play on top of, of the program stuff. And it sounded legit. Yeah. Um, but they still needed a drummer and a guitar player and a bass player and a keyboard player and a sax player to play a solo and stuff like that, you know, and, and a horn section because they couldn't do that yet. And then it changed, so they, you know, uh, uh, music started to change, but not only that, uh, um, the, the, you know, the technology got better and they were, uh, you know, they were able to duplicate some horns and, and some section orchestral kind of stuff. And uh, and then the next thing was, you know, it became harder for drummers because they had drum machines. Yeah. People are using drum machines. And then they got the synths, then they're using synth bass yeah. as opposed to bass players, which, um, you know, it, it, all, it all has a place, right? Yeah. Uh, the, the, luckily for me, the, the guitar is one of the hardest things for them because like a, a piano is really easy for them. Yeah. Because it's just, you're playing, you know, a piano part on, a, on, a, on an electric keyboard. Yeah. And once the samples got good enough, the sampling rates got better, then they could pretty they could get pretty close to sounding like a real piano. Yeah. And now the I think they can actually, right? I mean, you you you're on the technical end of it. You know. Yeah, it's still never quite the same, but it's pretty darn close. Yeah, it's it's kind yeah. of good enough, right? And, but it, it's there's a thing about feeling the air around it. Yeah. And hearing the air around it, and it, that you don't get from a, um, an electronic keyboard. But uh, anyway, the guitar is a lot trickier than that. Mm -hmm. And so my career lasted a lot longer than a lot of those other guys, but a lot of those other guys had been around already for 20 years. Oh yeah. So yeah. for 10, 20 years. So, you know, I, I, um, some of those guys have been around since the late forties and early fifties. Right. Yeah. And then I, you know, like Mo Kaufman and, and guys like that. So I stumbled into it in the mid seventies and then, uh, it was, it was like, like I said, it was like that for the first five or ten years, and it, it was still screaming. The the volume of work was screaming. Uh, then the technology changed, but the that all, all that meant was the circumstances were different. I was, yeah. you know, the, there weren't fifty people on the session. Now there were five or six. Yeah. Um, but the rhythm section was still really important, 
and the guitar part was important and playing it the right way was important and and, and then, then it started it evolved into um, being looser which was much <laughs> much more pleasant for me it, yeah. in the in the context of uh, here's just a chord chart man oh yeah you know like uh, you'll hear the programming you'll hear the stuff that we we programmed we need a guitar part on and we got a we, we hired a, a real bass player and a drummer today and uh, you know and you know got a couple horn players and uh, yeah so you're playing along with this pre-programmed stuff and you know we want we want it to sound like this you know yeah. whether it's it's uh, the police at the time like say in the 80s you know mm -hmm. madonna the police you know whatever uh, screedy politi or something you know yeah. uh, something like that we want it to sound like that okay fine yeah i know what that is and so that and i liked all that like to me the the uh, the, the other lucky thing again I'm, I'm a lot of good luck i keep saying it, but it's true more good luck than good management but uh i I enjoy those challenges. Yeah. I've got some friends that are great musicians that hated that. Oh, yeah. And so they didn't last through that, through those changes. But I, I loved the evolution of it all. Yeah. And I love the different styles. And I loved, okay, so now it's this. Okay, fine. This is the thing now. Sure. I'll, I can figure out how to do that. Yeah. You know, and it, it was just, it was fun for me and I enjoyed it. So uh, um, it made it. You know, I like that challenge. So it, it, I was kind of designed, I guess, but my brain is wired for that world. Yeah. You know, so. Well, oh, it's because re repetitive. I mean, just constant over and over and over and over and over again. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it, but, you know, it, it got to be where, where the musicians started having more input. Yeah. Uh, because they'd say, here's a chord chart, play something. But, you know, they'd give you some direction, like play it in this style. And, you know, th this is the kind of sound, but, or, the, you know, the area we think it should be go ahead and play something we'll see and see how it works and if they didn't like it they say change it and i said yeah okay good i can i can do a you know a lot of other stuff check this out check this out check this out you know yeah and tell me which one you like i don't you know i it, that's the other thing i is i have no ego about it and my the friends that i work with all the time are the same they have no ego it's just like it, what i played doesn't i didn't play it thinking that it was the most important thing in the world yeah and, and I don't think I'm that important myself at all. So I'm just happy to be here. So I'll do whatever you want. Yeah. You know, and, and it's fun because I, I like taking direction or, or you know, getting that, uh, somebody's giving you, uh, I guess, some idea of what they want and then editing it as you go. Yeah. You know, until you fine tune it, until you get something that everybody likes. Yeah. You know, and, and that was a, a lot of fun for me. So... Uh, I was built for it. So they, you know, in the mid eighties, from the mid seventies to the, to the mid eighties, it was all the orchestral, a lot of orchestral sessions. And then the orchestral guys were gone. Then the machines kind of took over and, and that went up into the you know mid nineties. And then, you know, man, I, I worked steady for 30 years. So yeah. I worked up to like Oh four and Oh five, seven days a week. That's crazy. The last five years or so it started to slow down. Yeah. And I could see that it was slowing down, and I knew that I, that it was never going to be going to happen anyway. Yeah. But the the industry just changed because now everything is done by one person. Yeah. You know, in in a room by himself. Yeah. And he, if there's guitar, he needs to, you know, he plays it himself. He plays enough guitar that, with the technology that's around, you can take all the time he needs to get a, a guitar part. You yeah, know, that exactly. he's happy with. So you cut and paste it and put it together, and so and there's no budget to hire a guitar player anymore. Yeah. Um, especially for jingles and, and TV shows, right? That kind of work. That's all gone. On records, they, you know, uh, country records, not on uh, pop records, you mm -hmm. know, like a, and, you know, anymore so much. I mean, it, it's, it, and they've, they've, um, they've managed to, to sample things. Uh, the sample rate's gotten good enough, the technology's gotten good enough, that they, they can sample an acoustic and an electric guitar just enough to get like a rhythm part yeah you get a part in a pension yeah and get by yeah. and, and it sort of works right yeah as you know but uh, uh but you know if you want a, a solo that has personality or uh you know uh, it, it sounds has musical musical construction it sounds like it comes from an interesting place you gotta hire a player yeah you know still i mean that's just the way it is yeah especially in the country world it just you can't you can't reproduce that stuff. Um, it's it's way too hard. Even even drum machines, uh, 
I mean, more modern country now. Yeah. Certainly there's a lot of loops and, uh, but that's a particular type of sound. Um, and as we mentioned, we were talking earlier, a lot of that stuff, it's just, there's nothing really super difficult going on. It's just a lot of it all yeah. at the same time. So, you know, you're not coming up with interesting drum parts that go with the piano, that go with the acoustic, go with the electric or and the piano has its spot in there. It just sort of seems to be more of a, um, you know, here's kind of a, a drive, a drive that we want to create. Yeah. Um, it's and a, you just, you know, you put in drive and go. It's um, a drone. Yeah. <laughs> in the background. And there's nothing wrong with it. And it works and it's the way it is now, uh, yeah, but it's just different than it was. Yeah. Um, it's different than it was. I mean, they were looking for personality or, or ideas. Yeah. And that, like, that's, you know, a lot of the, th- the reasons, uh, the, the jobs I get still get hired to do and that I still, uh, you know, the work that I still am blessed to have. Um, uh, it's because I've got a huge catalog of experience and a lot of ideas and a lot of, you know, a lot of crazy ideas. Some of them work, some of them don't. Uh, but I've, you know, uh, I'm good at, at coming up, like you said earlier, we were talking about, you know, coming up with, with an intro for a song that, that suits the song that serves the, you know, cause it's all about serving the song and the singer. Yeah. If, if you're talking about doing records. Uh, doing you know albums for people. I mean, it's it's all about serving the song and the singer, and that's the only thing that matters. Uh, it's not about how great the the guitar part is or how great the, the reverb is on the snare. Yeah, it has none. It doesn't matter if there's any reverb on the snare. You know, if the thing feels great and sounds great, and and the singer and the song are represented properly, that's all that matters. Yeah, you did your job then, right? And that's what you and I are called to do, right? Yeah, and that's you know, and we we have a lot in common. We think a lot the same way. That's why we've always uh, maybe had a lot of fun working together. But uh, when did you, um, when did you, uh, you hear that noise? Yeah, I heard a little something. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's my, it's a little, gle- oh yeah. It's, it's my cell phone next a, to it's the, a yeah. Phone. yeah. Um, when did you make the transition into doing more producing? Um, obviously there was a, they just kind of slowly ha- start happening. Obviously you're doing a lot of sessions and meeting a lot of people and, um, but you ended up doing a lot of producing work as well. Yeah, it, it started uh, because some producers that I worked for would hire me to uh, write arrangements, to do arrangements, like uh, or just to write the charts, you yeah. know, for the, for this. And I'd, I'd add a few ideas. At first, it started just just write charts for these songs, and 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 I said sure. And so I would do what I was told, and they'd give me you know uh, a cassette <laughs> back in those days. Yeah, and uh, it was a, you know. Uh, and it, I, I had a lot of experience with doing a lot of different things because I did all those TV shows. I, you know, I, I did. I was the music director on the Ronnie Prophet show mm-hmm. for six years, which was a dream job for me. Uh, which allowed that's what allowed me to uh, to not have to go on the road. Yeah. To be able to stay home to so that I, when the phone rang, I could go do those other sessions, right? Yeah. Because the the I had the the Tommy Hunter show, the Ronnie Prophet show, and a, a show called Nashville Swing, a couple other live live music shows, right? Yeah. And um, and then I did a lot of you know a lot of the pre-records like uh, for TV shows like Fraggle Rock and Sesame Street and and all that stuff too. So and, and TV series, many a lot of those. So that that allowed me to stop working in bars, stay at home, and focus on the studio work. And uh, um, you know it, it all it, it gave me the, doing like doing the Ronnie Prophet show and being the MD and having to write charts for all. Uh, the different artists that were on the show that the band had to back up you learn a lot about how things are put together yeah. when you're writing the charts for the band right you know that's the right that's the and you, you hear the same kind of bass part over and over and over because it works that's why they play it and you hear the same kind of drum part you hear the same kind of keyboard part or whatever that's because it works and you hear the you know the uh musical conversations going on between the um, you know between the keyboards and the guitars and the, and and uh, the fiddle and the steel guitar and the you know whatever right and uh, so I learned a lot from those things so I, from from that people started asking me to write charts uh, producers to write charts for records they were producing then I started to add some ideas sneak in some ideas of my own and they said, oh, that's cool to keep doing that. And uh, so I kept doing that. Um, and then uh, one thing led to another. Finally, uh, a, a couple artists came to me, uh, or their managers came to me personally. He said, look, would you produce a record for someone, for so-and-so? Uh, you know? I said, sure. I was stupid enough to, you know, t- 
to say, sure, why not? I can do that. Yeah. 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 And, uh, of course didn't know what I was getting into, but, uh, it was again in over my head, but it was something that came natural to me. Yeah. And, and luckily for me, my, I was strong enough in the music department from all the experience I had yeah. doing all those other shows and all those uh, working in all those other, uh, worlds, you know, those other contexts uh, that, uh, I was, you know, able to understand, okay, so this is, and actually from working with a lot of other good producers and, and writers, you see a lot of times, like after the first few years of my career, like I say, everything was written out for the first few year, few years. But after yeah. that, it was what the old school producers back in the fifties used to do, which was in LA and, and New York and Toronto and everywhere and Nashville, which was hire the best musicians and let them play. Yeah. Get out of their way and let them play. And they're going to give you something really good because that's what they do because they're proud of what they do. And they're not going to do a, 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 a mediocre job and leave you with a mess. They're going to do something. They're going to do the best they can for you. Right. Yeah. And so if you get the music part together, the, the other part kind of takes care of itself. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, I mean, a lot of funny things happened, you know, along the way, but there was, it was definitely a learning curve, but, uh, it still was okay because I would work with engineers that I was, that I was very close with friend, you know, good friends with. So I trusted them. Yeah. So I didn't need to know how to mic the drums and I didn't need to know how to, you know, to, to do any of that stuff. I just focused on the music. They recorded it, made it sound good. I said, there you go. There's your record. Are you happy? Yeah. Good. You know, so. Yeah, and it just makes sense, right? Um, as a producer, you're going to have the best guitar player or the best drummer come in and play. Well, you're not really going to tell them how to play. No. Because he already plays way better than you would ever think of playing. Yeah. So what right do you have to tell them what to do? You may have a direction or an idea. That's right. Or, you know, we're going down this path, mm -hmm. but to let them do let them do what they thing. do because they're that's what they're really good at yeah and that's why you hired them i mean mm -hmm. if 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 uh if, it's if like you, being a coach of a hockey team exactly you're not going to go out and you're not going to be the the goaltender um just because you want to show them what to do unless you're as good as the guy that's yeah in that i mean it's yeah you can let them know what they're doing wrong or advise them but um just let the let the pros do it and just well, direct. Yeah, exactly. I mean, to Tony, to, sorry, Tommy Lasorda, uh, the great uh, uh, Dodgers uh, manager for, for a long, long time, uh, had a great line about baseball. He said, uh, there's three kinds of baseball players. Uh, there's, there's the f first kind that make, that make the play happen. Yeah. There's the second kind that watch the play happen. And then there's the third ones that are on the field that's, that look around and say, what just happened? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so, I mean, you, you can't, you know, you can, all, you can only send the best guys out there that you have yeah. and hope they get the job done, but you can't go out in the field and do it for them. Yeah. They have to go out and do it, you know, and, and music is a team sport. Uh, no matter what anybody says, music is a team sport and there's nothing uh, more satisfying or, or more, there, there's, there's nothing richer uh, musically than having like five great musicians in a room that really know what they're doing that with lots of experience that know how to do their job great and you get f f five great personalities yeah all in one package right then the music is five times better yeah because you know you can also hear the stuff a lot of stuff uh, that's that's done by one person and it sounds like it's done by one per it's one person's idea yeah you know, the, the drum part, the bass part, the guitar part, the keyboard part, the whole thing, it's one person's idea. And he's, that same person is also engineering, yeah. you know, and producing and doing everything and, and getting the coffee, you know, and whatever. I mean, it's just, it, it's so much richer when there's more people with more ideas because it's, you, you got, you know, it's, the water's deeper and it's, it's more satisfying, right? Yeah. Uh, but, you know, I, I learned really, really hard, uh, or uh, not the hard way, I didn't, I just, I learned really fast uh, in, when I started first couple of records that I started uh, producing. And the, what I did was I, I hired the right guys. I hired a couple of my best friends who are monster players, um, a drummer named Barry Keane and, and uh, a bass player named Tom Sesniak, who I, I love both of them, and they're just, they're just the greatest. And I remember th I had worked, because I had done a lot of jingles, and a lot of TV work. I was used to seeing 
uh, some writers who would literally write out not only a drum part, but a drum, like the drum fills yeah. that they want. They would lift a drum fill from a, a Toto record or something and, and write it out. Mm-hmm. And, you know, say, here, that's what I want. And, uh, you know, I hand it to the drummer, hand, hand the bass player a, a, a bass part from another record and whatever. Right? And so I thought, well, that's what you're supposed to do right? at, at first. So the first couple of sessions I did, I, I, you know, did a little, I had a little drum machine at home and, and I play a little bit of bass and I'd write out a little bass part and I'd write out uh, the drum part and I'd give it to, to Tom and Barry. And uh, inevitably we'd start playing it and, and I'd think, gee, I, I thought it was going to sound better than this. You know, like this is not sounding, it's not making it. It's not really sounding right. And we'd play the, the song a couple of times. And finally, one of those guys like, you know, Barry, who's uh, such a gentleman, uh, would say to me, hey, uh, hey, man, uh, are you sure this is the drum part you want? Mm-hmm. And I'd say, well, no, I'm not sure of anything, honestly. I don't know. And he'd say, well, why don't you let me just try this? I got an idea. Just let me try this thing. See, see if you like it. And I'd say, sure. Oh, yeah, please. And so we'd do it. And of course, it would be 10 times or 110 times better than what I had. Right? Yeah. And so, I, you know, and the bass would be the same with Tom with the bass. And uh, so finally, I realized very quickly, you know, if you just hire the right guys and, and uh, what it's come down to now is what we were talking about earlier. I mean, if I hire the right guys and I say, OK, so here's the, I wrote the chart. and Here's the idea I have. And I, and I play a little acoustic guitar and say, here's what I think it should, you know, kind of the area that it's in, mm-hmm. you know, the bag it's in or where it where it sits musically, where it feels good musically in my mind. And yeah, they go, yeah, OK. And they, they listen for about 30 seconds. They go sit down at their instrument, pick it up, start to play and bam. There it is. Yeah. And it's, I don't have, to, I've, I've never said anything to them other than they've listened to me and they know me enough that they, when they hear, they go, okay, yeah, I know what you're getting at by just hearing a, a verse and half a chorus. Yeah. And you find too, when you're using those type of players, if it's not coming together, then there's something else wrong. Yeah. So the song's not right or the melody's not right or something's yeah. not right. It's not them. No. There's something else wrong structurally yeah. with, uh, with the song or something that's that's a real true sound sound or thing i found out when i was producing a lot it's just like sometimes you just get something it's like yeah how come this isn't coming together and it's like okay yeah this is there's just something there's a flaw yeah Yeah, there there's a flaw and that that's why uh um either you do it you do it you actually do two things um I spend a lot of time, if, if I'm a, do, doing arrangements for somebody for a record, I still do a lot of that, yeah. uh, singer-songwriters, or if I'm producing, or, or both, doesn't matter. But I'll spend a lot of time ahead of time trying to come up with the right chord changes and like re, basically sometimes totally rewrite the song musically from a harmonic con, uh, uh, concept or, you know, uh, from, from the harmonic concept and, and from the, the approach of the feel and stuff. Yeah. And, uh, and, but then still lots of times we get in the studio and it doesn't matter if there's a, you know, uh, again, the same group of guys, um, that I've worked with for, uh, you know, endlessly for years, for 40 years. And, uh, if we have the opportunity in the right environment, we'll get in the studio and we start playing a song. And it doesn't matter if I wrote the chart or the bass player wrote the chart or the drummer, it doesn't matter. We sit down and we start playing and then somebody will say, okay, so it's all working, but what's wrong? What's going on at the end of the chorus between the chorus and the, and the next verse? Yeah. There's something like, it's just not happening. There's something, there, there's gotta be a better idea. And one of us will say, who's got an idea? So I say, well, what if, we, what if we try this? Okay, good, let's try it. If it works, everybody's, everybody knows right away, immediately. Yeah. yeah, that worked. Okay, let's do that. And if it doesn't, somebody says, well, that sucked, didn't it? Yeah, it did. And no, nobody gets their feelings hurt. No. It's like, no, that, that didn't make it. Okay, uh, sorry, my idea was bad. Who's got a better one? Somebody else will say, what about, what about this? What about we do this? We, you know, what about we you know, make it a 2-4 bar and we, we, you know, we change this, we change the length and we... You know, uh, we, we change the chords and we do this and we do that. And we, we stop, g- give it a little t- moment to breathe, let the, 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 the singer pick it up. Yeah. And all of a sudden, boom, it's, yeah, there it is. Now it sounds right. And then there's some songs that just can't be helped. <laughs> yeah, I know. There's nothing you can do. <laughs> there's nothing you can do. But, you know, most of the time you can find a way with enough people. Yeah. If you got enough people and good people in the room to make it work, someone will figure it out. Yeah, but sometimes it just it's not going to work. Yeah, you know. Uh, I was I was just thinking the uh, the first time that I remember that I met you, um, I was I can't remember who I was playing with a country artist of some sort, 
and uh, it was a telethon of some sort. <laughs> and you were the band leader for for all the artists are coming on. It's a TV thing. And uh, I still remember getting there and everyone, you know, around me is going, hey, that's, that's, you know, that's Mike Francis. That's, I think Sesniak was playing and, and all the guys. And I was like, wow, holy crap. So, you know, same type of thing. For me, I was like, okay, we're going to get up and play. I was really nervous, right? And uh, I remember playing and I remember distinctly, because I, I was set up and I was really close to you. And we did our thing and I kind of turned around and you, you took a couple seconds to shake my hand and say, you know, really great job and whatever. And it was, you know, that little moment, you know, from someone when you were young mm -hmm. that was, you know, in their A game um, that just kind of went, wow, that, that gave me that boost of confidence that stayed with me a long time. Well, thank you. I'm glad, I'm glad I did that. Yeah. A lot, it's, a it's, lot. It came back, and I remember years later, I've, I've, I've told you, and I've said on the podcast before, when I remember the first time hiring you for a session, and, and uh, same thing, I was really nervous, and I've always thought, okay, I'm, I'm always using great musicians, but then I just thought, I, I just want to take that next step and, and start saying, hiring some of the really, you know, the top guys from Toronto, and, and you know, you heard everything about them, but I, was, I didn't know if I could sit in with you guys, right? Oh, if yeah. you could fit in. Okay. Um, but when you showed up and you you did the gig, it was like, oh my god, this was fantastic, and everything just kind of fell into place, and and you showed uh, so much respect for me, and and it was it was great. I and and after that, I was like, okay, I just just no turning back from that. It was just <laughs> such a great experience um, that well, you know I really appreciate that. It was really great. You're really kind, but uh, you know, there, I mean, as I said earlier, there there I had a lot of people that that uh, helped me and gave me a hand and, and, you know, gave me a pat on the back too once in a while. And it's really important. I think it's, yeah. I think you see too much of the opposite of that yeah. with musicians, you know, and I mean, we're always bad for talking about other musicians, right? And we, yeah. and you do that. And, and some, a lot of it's just for fun and everyone's got a unique personality. There's always something to say about somebody because musicians are quirky. Oh, we're all nuts. Yeah. Different <laughs> we're, people. Nobody's crazier than us. Yeah. Um, but when it comes down, there's lots of loyalty. Um, and I think, you know, that's, it's, and being able to see someone younger and, and, uh, uh, helping them, giving them a chance. I think that's all really, really, really important. Well, I, yeah, I, and I agree. And people did that for me. And so I've tried in my own little way, couple, you know, with, uh, any time I can to, to pass that along. But, uh, you know, the other thing that I found out early, cause I was always scared to death, you know, like what you were just talking about yeah. when you walk into that world for the first time. And I, you know, for months I was scared to death. And then I realized those guys aren't judging me. They're actually happy when I play, when I relax and play better. Yeah. They're actually happier and they like it. And they're, they're actually there to help me. They're trying to help me. They're not trying to make my life miserable. They're actually, they're rooting for me. They, they want to see it work out. Yeah. And, you know, I, and I, that, when I realized that, you know, again, the light bulb went off and I went, oh, that's, it's like a brotherhood where these guys, want to see you succeed yeah they want to see you you know and uh, fit in and get better and and grow and uh, and they're happy and they're glad to have you so that was uh you know a, a revelation for me but a, 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 you mentioned telethons and i got to, you know uh, we're talking about a lot of serious stuff but i gotta tell you a couple funny things because telethons or in any situation where it's which like a telethon is is absolutely live yeah there's no tape there's no redos if, if the set falls down behind you, you got to keep playing. Yeah. You know, like no, there's no, you know, if, if the lights all go out, but the, the recording equipment is still working, you keep on playing, right? It doesn't matter what happens, right? And uh, so I did a lot of those telethons. And, and um, one guy that used to produce a bunch of them uh, was a sweetheart of a guy, but he was a little bit too generous to the musicians. Like he used to have a suite for the musicians. We would start Friday afternoon and we would play Friday afternoon, do some rehearsing and play Friday night. Yeah. And then he would have a suite for the musicians with 
free booze. Oh, yeah. Very bad idea. <laughs> at 1 a.m. with a bunch of music. And then they, they're supposed to be back at noon the next day. Now, there would be a band going all night long because some... In, first couple of years when I wasn't really in the scene, I'd, I would be doing the midnight shift with the, you yeah. know, the midnight guys or like all night long guys. And then the other guys would come back at 11 or 12 the next day and then work all, you know, you'd work all day and in into the night and then you'd go party again and then you'd have to come back Sunday morning oh, yeah. and play all day until six o'clock. And there were some hilarious, absolutely hilarious moments. Uh, one, I'll, I'll tell you one that was absolutely frightening but i'll tell you another one that was that was just just absolutely funny hilarious but uh one thing that happened to me was uh, do you remember the uh show called barney miller a tv show mm-hmm. called? Oh, yeah. the, the star of that show was hal linden mm-hmm. and he's uh originally a, like a lot of those actors a lot of those tv actors a shakespearean actor yeah. and he was in uh, uh niagara on the lake doing some shakespeare thing it was a it was a summertime telethon it was a sick kids telethon in the summer out at CFTO, and um, so you know, Friday night they were talking. Well, geez, Hal Linden's in uh, in Niagara. Maybe we can get him to come here. You know, if we can, it'd be great. So, you know, I thought, well, yeah, that's nice. You know, whatever. Hal Linden's not coming, but you know, sure. So uh, the talk was going on Friday night, then Saturday, and then Sunday. We we get the uh, you know somebody gets a call and then somebody call, and the director comes with, it says Al Linden's on his way. We send a limo for him. He's going to be here. He's literally got about twenty or thirty minutes. We, like to, he, he's got they got to drive from Niagara to get here, they, and then they got to drive him back for his show today, yeah. right? So uh, he's going to have a half an hour when he gets here. and We have to do him whenever he gets here, no matter what's going on. When he walks in the building, it's Hal Linden time. Okay, fine, whatever. So the band was set up. At this particular time, I don't know why. Usually, the the piano player was generally the leader on these gigs, and the, and the mm-hmm. piano would be in front of the band. Yeah, and then in the middle are the drums, and then uh, like you know, and then the you know, the other guys are lined up between the piano and the drums, uh, and, and you know, in whatever whatever they want. Horns on the left, and guitar and bass, on, two guitars and bass or whatever, and keyboards on the right, right, yeah. synths and stuff like that. So, okay, so fine. So this one was, they had set the band up in a funny place in the room and, and in a funny way. It was all set up in a line. Uh, so the, the piano player, who was the music director, was about 20 feet away to my right. Yeah. So, they, and so like between him was a couple, were a couple of keyboard players and a sax player. Uh, and then behind us was the drums. And then, and then on, the, on the end of the line was, was myself and then the bass player, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, it's only just a small band with you know two uh, with one guitar and and a couple of but two or three keyboards and, and a sax player right yeah. so but but they were set us up in this funny situation so um hal linden comes and he's got his music director with him so that's good and he's the music director has charts and he says here's the charts and he, he and he's really in a hurry and they're frantic everybody's you know like in a hurry and a hurry we got to because we got to do a sound check and and run the this chart down and it's a medley with five songs in it oh yeah Okay, so he throws charts in front of us, the, the music director, and he sits down at the piano, and they get the microphone working for Hal Linden, and Hal Linden's about 25 feet away from me, directly in front of me, right? Yeah. And so I can peek over the music stand and see him. So we start playing this thing, and I'm going, boom. It's, I've got a part that's written in the bass clef, first of mm-hmm. all, and I'm wondering, what's, what's, what's with this? And I'm going, boom, 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 and the bass player's, we didn't know the bass player had the guitar part. I had the bass part, <laughs> so we get like we get about six bars into or ten bars into it or whatever. And Hal Linden says, "Stop, stop, stop!" He says, he comes over. He says, "What? What the heck are you guys doing?" I said, "I don't know. I'm playing this part." And he looks. He says, "You got the bass part, and you got the guitar part." So he flips them. Okay, and I went. Oh, okay, whatever. So let's start again. Okay, so we start again, and again, so this medley has five songs, as I said, and it's in each song's in a different key. Mm-hmm. Some are in a different tempo. And one of them's in a different time signature. It goes from 4-4 four, four to 3-4, four, right? So we, we only get two songs in. And they say, you know, the, the director screams, stop, everybody stop, stop, stop. We're back on the air. Oh, yeah. We're live on air. We only got two songs into the medley. And now we got to do it. And, in the, and they announce, and he, ladies and gentlemen, you know, uh, we're so lucky to have him here, blah, 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 from, you know. From Niagara on the Lake, uh, from, from right now, Hal Linden of Barney Miller fame, and here he is to sing a, this beautiful medley for you. And we said, okay, so we start playing the medley, and we had never gotten this far, but the third song 
when because uh, you know look, while you're playing when you're used to doing it mm-hmm. you can cheat and look ahead and i see at the top of like the third or fourth page it says it it, cha- it goes from 4/4 four, four to 3/4 three, four, tempo change time change and it says guitar and vocal only <laughs> And we never got there yet, right? So, okay, yeah, sure. And I'm looking ahead and I'm thinking, this is going to be great. And the piano player is not in front of me where I can see him. Mm -hmm. He's down there. So, you know, I realize when we get there, if I look at him, when I look back, I'm going to be lost. Yeah. I'm toast, right? So all I I think, okay, I got only one chance, one hope in hell here, right? My my only chance, and luckily we could hear, the monitors were good, we could hear Hal Linden singing, Mm -hmm. is is I'm gonna gonna look at him like a laser beam. I'm gonna focus on him, and I'm gonna listen to him like a German shepherd, and like (laughs) no matter where he goes, I'm going, right? Mm -hmm. So I play the key change for him, and, and then I go bring you know in, in the new key mm-hmm. and if on the first downbeat and he starts and I can see him like uh, sideways kind of glancing over at me mm-hmm. hoping that I'm gonna, <laughs> hoping and praying like looking and saying I hope you see what I see you know what I know I hope you're looking at the chart and, and, I, and I'm nodding yeah and I'm, I'm looking at him and I'm listening to him and, and I'm just watching and listening and I play along with him and we get through it and then the rest of the band comes back in and then, and then it ends <laughs> thank God <laughs> and I'm sweating like I'm just, like, you know, like I just came out of the shower. Like, I'm yeah. just soaking wet with sweat. And Helen, and he comes over, and he puts his hand on my shoulder. He says, man, thank you. He said, I know what you did, and I love you. <laughs> <laughs> I said, thank you, sir. <laughs> but uh, I almost had a baby. Oh, I'm okay. <laughs> you know, like, really, I almost had a child. He said, yeah, I did, too. He said, but we, we made it. He yeah. said, you did good. And uh, out of the corner of my eye, I, when that was happening, I could see the piano player waving his arms. I don't know if he was waving me off. Yeah. Or if he was trying to, to give me the tempo or what, but I just watched Hal Linden and I just I listened and watched. Yeah. And I survived. And you know, but it was it was terror, right? <laughs> it, oh, that would be scary. Oh that yeah, yeah. live TV because like you can't if it like I said, if it crashes and burns, it, it crashes and burns and you gotta say, yeah. sorry, could can, can we pick it up from there? Sorry, folks, we had a big problem here. And you don't want that. No. <laughs> yeah, you don't want to be the guy that did that. Because then you're famous for that, right? Yeah, you know, like that. The, every story in the world is going to be told about you. There's a, there's a bunch of tele, telethon stories. I'll tell you one more quick one. There was uh, a guy who, uh, who who was the music director on a lot of them. A guy named Jack Lenz, and he's a very talented man and a sweetheart of a guy. And mm-hmm. yeah, but he would get nervous, and and sometimes like there's at some point there's always a panic in those three days right yeah and the director would be yelling at one thing at him and the producer would be yelling something else at him and he'd be trying to figure it all out and and the, the artist would be you know coming on uh, up stepping up to the microphone getting ready to sing a song or we'd be we'd, we'd be going to commercial or something and and he'd look at the rhythm section and say we would need a cue to go to commercial he'd say uh uh, I'll play 11, the Q11, because he'd have a whole, a whole list of cues written out, like little, just little little vamps, oh, right? Yeah. So I'll let number 11. Then he'd look at the horns, and somebody would say to him, no, no, Jack, and not yet. Wait, 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 we, got, we have a few, few seconds here. Just hang on. And he'd look at the horns. He'd say, okay, 17. And we'd hear him say that, but, and, and then the guy said, go, 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 right? And so he'd start counting. Well, once he starts counting, you you got to play. Yeah. And those guys are playing a different chart a different piece of music than you are and and they're not backing down and you're not backing down because you can't right <laughs> like what are you going to do so it's just you got a cough and you get like music in two keys two tempos it's just a disaster right yeah uh two sets of chords it's just a whole nightmare but poor jack he got uh he got flustered once and uh, if you remember the the song from uh, the big hit song from the, the tune uh, from the movie dirty dancing Mm-hmm. Um, you know the intro is well, I've had the time, time of my life, life yeah. and I never felt this way before well if you listen to it if, if you and w- then the, the, there's that little part in the front where it's just the vocals but then when you if you analyze it you find out that um, they're just singing half of the tempo of the regular so- of the song when yeah. it comes in so it, you know if it's if it's this dun, ha, da, 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 when the thing comes in it's dun, da, da, dun, da, yeah. It's that's where the tempo is, and that's where the feel is, right? So these there's these two poor singers out front. They were jingle singers, but they were giving them a chance to, to uh, you know, and they were just killing, filling time basically on yeah. the telethon to to do a, a feature, to be featured doing a number. So they were going to sing this song, and so again, somebody was, you know, two two or three people were talking to Jack at the same time, 
And then they said, okay, go, 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 go. We're, we're, we're on, we're on, we're on. You know, mm -hmm. go, go, go. And so he kind of said, one, two, one, two, three, four. And there, the, the two singers up there saying, well, well, I've had a time of my life and I never felt it before. And you can, <laughs> for some reason, I don't know why my wife had videotaped this little segment of the show. Oh, yeah. And I, I have it on videotape. Now, it's probably useless anymore. You couldn't see it. But you can see the two singers looking at each other out of the corner of their eye because they're thinking, it's going to turn into a bluegrass song. <laughs> Pretty close to the whole time. <laughs> and so they did their little thing up front. And, and then, thank God, you know, again, this is why musicians, you appreciate guys that, that literally save your life sometimes. The, this drummer named Jorn Anderson, who's a brilliant oh, yeah. player, beautiful player, and a be sweetheart of a guy. And he, he knew better. He knew that Jack had messed up, you know, that it was just, a, you know, like a, an error. And so when it came time for the groove to kick in, he wasn't supposed to play a field, but he just went, boom, 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 you know, and yeah. like, here it is, you know, the, this is the tempo, and everybody went, ah, oh, thank God, <laughs> thank God, because it could have been a horrible mess, right? It would have been so fast, and so, but he just said, I'm not letting that happen. Yeah. And he just took care of it musically, right? Yeah. So you, you, you can't, if, when, he, when a drummer plays that big of a field that loud, you got to play with him. Yeah. <laughs> He's in charge right now. He's in charge, bud. And it's a good thing he was. Oh, yeah. You know, but uh, those That's are things scary. that happen. Yeah, the live TV is scary. Oh, God, yeah. You see, uh, you know, you see the big shows on TV now and, and you see what happens. And it's like, you, you understand why a lot of them will just go out and lip sync and, yeah. and or else maybe just the band's faking and then they're singing lead because it's, man, the disastrous stuff that can happen. And, um Oh, yeah. You know, technically, you know, sound wise, and you know, by the time you do your sound check and you run your song, and to the time you actually do it, oh, there's yeah. a million different things that can go wrong, and ten million, yeah, <laughs> or, or or more. No, yeah. anything can happen. I mean, and yeah, I, you know, that that's the the beauty of it. That's the the charm of it. Yeah, but that's also the absolute terror of it too, right? That's why you see a lot of you know a lot of those shows, even the producers, uh, you know, floor directors and yeah, uh, engineers, they do all of them. Yeah. I mean, there's like a, one set of people that they go from the Oscars to the Grammys yes. to the whatever. Because they're the best. Yeah. They're the guys that do everything. And, you know, and there's, there's very few people, very extremely rare that somebody sings live now. Yeah. You know, I mean, uh, they'll, they'll, like, for example, the Super Bowl coming up, there'll be a few of the bands in the afternoon that are playing for the stadium where that'll be live. Yeah. But the, 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 uh, the halftime show is going to be pre-recorded, and they're yeah. they're going to be uh, lip syncing and miming, you know. And unless it's you know it, back in the day, somebody like a James Brown or a Ray Charles is like, you don't need to help Ray Charles or James Brown. <laughs> yeah, know? they're used to that. Yeah, you know Aretha Franklin. Who are, well, not only that, just get out of their way and let them do it because they're they're just so great. I mean, and now you know with uh, Twitter and and everything, you you do one little thing wrong. Oh yeah, and it's just it's that's. It's all over the place. It's yeah. Crazy. Yeah. And, it, you know, things, if anything can, can go wrong, it will eventually, something will go wrong for yeah. sure. So that's why a lot of producers and, and artists are just afraid of it. Yeah. You know, and, and so that's why, you know, I've got to forget what it was two or three years ago, but uh, Mariah Carey was on. Yeah, it was one, the New Year's Eve thing. The New Year's yeah. Eve thing. Yeah. And, and she, she didn't have any monitors. She kept telling them, I can't hear anything. I can't. And they kept saying, no, you, you'll have it. Don't worry, you'll have it. And then she was out there singing. She had no monitors. And, I felt sorry for her, you know, yeah. the poor girl. I mean, she's a great talent, but uh, you can't sing when you can't hear. Yeah. You know, no, so what can you do? And she, yeah. she looked foolish and she felt horrible and she wasn't very happy. You could see that, but yeah. and I don't blame her. You know, so that, that was uh, you know, a technical error, but it, it, it happens. happens. It's it, going to happen. There's, you know, yeah, it's got to happen. This yeah. can't be perfect every <laughs> single time. No, it, it, if you can laugh at it, it's a lot of fun. I know. That's what I like to do, even on stage or... Uh, you know, if you're working with people, you make a mistake. Everyone makes mistakes. Yeah, yeah. And I'm always, you know, some people get offended. I can, I can tell. Hey, maybe it's because they're not very confident on what they do. But um, it, you know, I'll be on stage. Something will happen, and and you know, I'll turn and take a look, and we'll laugh. And yeah, but and it's fun. You know, it's great. You know, it, it is was, great. It was silly, but then you get the, the ones I've worked with a few people, and they're just like. You know, something happened, you turn around to kind of, and they won't even look at you. They're paranoid. Or yeah, anything. they're like, yeah. And, or they just look like nothing happened at all. Yeah. Or else they'll do this, you know, they'll play the same thing again, make it look like they meant to do it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's yeah. all those tricks, right? And I was like, 
Yeah, I know you made a mistake, but it was funny. Yeah. And, and I know you're not going to do it again, so let's just laugh about it, right? It's it's okay. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you don't have to nobody's going to die over this. Yeah. I mean, no. that, that's it's just music. That's the other thing. You got to get, get get you know, get uh, get back in the real world. It's just music and it's yeah. you know, it's meant to be fun and it's for that's enjoyment. What it's there for, yeah. But uh, you know, you, yeah. There's there's always things that that fall down or they don't go, you know, don't go right and yeah. and it's yeah. Just lighten up and have a good time. Yeah. You know, we'll all survive this. No kidding. <laughs> Well, we should wrap it up. It's been a great talk. Uh, I think we could do this again sometime and, and get into oh, guitars a lot. and stories and yeah. And, uh, but it was an, it was a great visit back and figuring out where you got, you know, to where you are now. And and um, you know, I, I always know you. Every time I've ever given you a call or chatted with you, you're you're always practicing. <laughs> sort of like I always tell everyone, I don't know anyone who practices as much as you do. And you, you do those things. You do the, the the fundamentals, the scales. And you were talking earlier, uh, and it was a great lesson for anybody, I think. When you, in your, in your studio here, you've got right in front of your keyboard right there, it's two metronomes. Two metronomes, yeah. Yeah. One one stops working, the other one will. Yeah. <laughs> I'm ready. And you're practicing, you, you played me the tempo of, of yeah. what you do scales at, and it was really slow. Oh, yeah. It's not 63 beats a minute. It's not fast. It's just no. slow, slow, yeah. slow. There it is. And yeah. that's that's where you need to practice. You can play fast as much as you want, but playing accurate in time slow is way harder yeah. than, than it is fast. Well, so, yeah, somebody said, uh, a drummer said something to me once, a friend of mine, and, and he said he had a teacher who said to him, if you can't play it slow and make it, properly and make it sound good yeah. and, and, and have it sound clear. If you can't do that, how the heck do you think you can do it fast yeah. and make it sound good? You can't. You're just stumbling over it. So you're just yeah. fumbling and stumbling around is what you're doing. So, so slow down, learn to play it slow and focus on the, all the, all the, the minute details yeah. of what you're doing. And then when you play it fast, it'll be easy. Yeah. And it's true. It you know, it, it's it's easy it's way harder to play slow than it is to play fast. Yeah. Much harder to play slow and consistent and even. Yeah, and accurate. And, yeah, yeah, accurate and you know, in, in, in the same pocket and the same tempo and the, the you know, the, the same way. It's much harder to do that slow than it is to, to play a million miles an hour. because uh, that's you know, um uh, it just is. It just is a fact of life. Yeah. So there you go. It's and it's 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 not that I'm I'm always I hope I'm not always practicing the same thing when you call, but I'm always I'm usually put, got a guitar in my hands. That's that's yeah, for sure. That's amazing. Uh, it's, it's a disease. Yeah, it's, yeah it is. <laughs> it really is. Before we go, uh, obviously uh, a lot of people call you Peppy. Oh yeah. Where did that come from? That's you know what um, I wish I had a funny story for you. Yeah. I wish I had a story that was it's hilarious, not, but it's not funny at all. Uh, it's just one of those. It's one of those things that happens to you yeah. um, by accident. Like uh, it was. It was when I was working in the states, and um, as we both know, a lot of uh, Ill I was illegal. I was underage. Yeah. I was illegal. My parents drove me across the border with the, my guitar and amp and my suitcase in the, in the trunk. And uh, everything was illegal, right? Yeah. So I'm underage, I'm illegal in the States, I'm everything. But this is 1969, it wasn't like it is now. Yeah. Right? And so uh, we both know that a lot of illegal immigrants in the United States are Spanish. Yeah. <laughs> from Mexico and, you know, South America, right? And they call them all Juan or Pepe. Yeah. And so because I was, uh, you know, I'm a little guy, I got dark hair, and, and, you know, I... I look close enough to being the, the type maybe. Mm -hmm. And it, so somebody just started calling me Peppy one day as a joke. <laughs> and, you know, I, you know, while I was there, I mean, that's what my name became, you know, uh, to all the people I work with in the States. And then when I came home and then I migrated to Toronto, as I told you earlier, mm -hmm. um, I thought, oh, good, I got rid of that. You know, it's, it, it's not that it bugged me or anything. It's just, yeah. I just, I got rid of the nickname. That's good. That's fine. I'll be Mike again. And then I ran into Stevie Smith and his brother Greg, and they said, first thing they said out of their mouth was, hey, Peppy, how you doing? <laughs> and there were other musicians around, and they all heard that, and, they, and everybody started calling me that. Yeah. And then it just it stayed with me my whole life. Yeah. And somebody's calling right now saying, where are yeah. you? Hey, Peppy. Peppy, where are you? <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks again for uh, spending a couple hours here. That was a great insight. And uh, Thank you let's for do your... it again, and let's hang out some more. It's been way too long. Yeah, it has, man. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you very yeah. much. You're Thank a kind you. man. Thank you.